name is Alyssa Olson and I am the president of the Planning Commission. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll to verify quorum. Uh, Commissioner Alper will be absent this evening. Commissioner Baxley. Commissioner Campbell. Here. Commissioner Fayola. Here. Commissioner Ford. Here. Commissioner Marwa. Here. Commissioner McGuire. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Rainville. Here. That's seven members present. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, next, we'll proceed to the agenda, a copy of which uh, is posted for public access uh, to the city's legislative information management system, which is lims.minneapolismn.gov, or you can grab one from the back table there. Uh, we'll begin with acceptance of the minutes from April 25th. Could I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? That motion passes and the minutes are adopted. Our next order of business is to organize the public hearing. I'm gonna read through the agenda items and state whether they're slated for consent, discussion, or continuance. Consent items will be adopted by the board without discussion uh, with all, um, we'll be adopting the staff recommendations and any stated conditions. Um, cons uh, discussion items we will discuss and then certain items may be continued to a future meeting. So if you agree with the staff recommendation, you do not need to do anything, but if there's an item that you would like to discuss, um, you can raise your hand or let us know that you would like to discuss that item uh, and we can put it on, on the discussion agenda. So uh, I'll start with item number four, 901 27th Avenue South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against staff recommendation on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll put item four on consent. Item number five is Prince Rogers Nelson Way commemorative street renaming. First Avenue North between 7th Street North and 8th, 8th Street North and staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against staff recommendation? All right, seeing none, I'll put item five on consent. Item number six is 4146 Fremont Avenue North and staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against staff recommendation? All right, seeing none, I'll put item number six on consent. Item number seven, 5121 and 5129 France Avenue South. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Okay, we'll put this item on discussion. Item number seven, we'll discuss. Item number eight, uh, 2603 through 2621 Bloomington Avenue. Staff is, or we are continuing this item one cycle to the May 23rd meeting. So we will continue item number eight. Item number nine, 715 and 719 Lowry Avenue Northeast. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number nine? Right, seeing none, we'll put nine on consent. Item number 10, 1500 James Avenue North, we will discuss this item. Item number 11, 3225 East Minnehaha Parkway, staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against staff recommendation? All right, we'll put item number 11 on discussion. Item number 12, 315 and 319 13th Avenue North, uh, 1312 University Avenue Northeast. Okay, we'll put item number 12 on discussion. And item number 13, 1530 East Franklin Avenue, staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone who would like to speak against staff recommendation for item 13? 
All right, seeing none, we'll put item 13 on consent. So we have items four, five, six, nine, and 13 on consent. Items 7, 10, 11, and 12 on discussion, and we will continue item number eight. Commissioners, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Chair, if I may interrupt just one moment. Um, I apologize, I'm <laughs> getting over a cold, so I have had a coughing attack over here, but um, I just want to confirm the numbers that I had because I think I had some overlap. So I have for consent four, five, six, nine, and 13, and then I have eight, excuse me, eight for continue, mm -hmm. and then I had seven, 10, 11, and 12 for discussion. Yes, if I didn't say that, that's what I meant. Okay, I'm so glad we're in agreement. Thank okay. you, Chair. <laughs> All right, uh, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes and the agenda is adopted. Uh, we're gonna open the, the public hearing on our consent agenda, so if there was an item that uh, was on the consent agenda that you would like to speak on, um, now would be the time. Uh, so those items would be four, five, six, nine, or 13. If you would like to come up to the podium, state your name and address for the record and go ahead. Commission President Olson, commissioners, my name is Jim Dubois. I live at 3220 East Minnehaha Parkway in Minneapolis. I have submitted some comments in opposition to the project already to right. Mr. Crandall, so it should be in your uh, document packet. So we are discussing that item, I believe. Okay. Yes, correct. You know, okay, so this is not the time to, to speak on it, and but we will get to that. Oh, I'm You'll terribly have the sorry. No, no worries. Pardon me. All right. So is there anyone who would like to speak on any consent items? Can you repeat those that I missed what you were? Yep. Four, five, six, nine, or 13. All right, I'm not seeing any, so we will close the public hearing on the consent agenda. Commissioners, could I have a motion to uh, adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes. So if you were here for items four, five, six, nine, or 13, those items were approved. Uh, and good luck with your projects. All right, we had one item that was continued and that was item number eight, which was 2603 through 2621 Bloomington Avenue North. Uh, this is going to be continued uh, one, er, one cycle to the May 23rd meeting, but if you came here today to speak on this item, um, we will take your testimony now. All right, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, so commissioners, uh, well, I'll close the public hearing for the continuance item, could I have a motion uh, to continue item eight to the May 23rd meeting? So moved. Second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. So that item will be heard at the May 23rd meeting. We will now move on to our discussion items. Uh, the first one is item number seven and staff is Shanna Sether. Good afternoon, President Olson, City Planning Commissioners. My name is Shanna Sether. I am a city planner for the City of Minneapolis in the Community Economic, Community Planning and Economic Development Department and the assigned planner for the France Avenue Apartments. 
very nice to see you all in person. Item number seven on today's agenda is for the properties located at 5121 and 5129 France Avenue South. The existing properties are two single family dwellings. They're zoned R1A and uh, multiple family district and BFC3, which is the corridor three built form overlay district. The applicant is before you today to request um, approval of a new four story multiple family dwelling with 28 units. Here's the primary zoning map. So you can see the property is zoned R1A. So R1A is a multiple family district. However, it restricts the maximum number of dwelling units to three. Therefore, the applicant is seeking a rezoning or a petition to rezone the properties from R1A to the R4 multiple family district. The BFC3 corridor three built form overlay is already in place on the property. So that allows for uh, maximum building heights to be regulated through that district, floor area ratio, setbacks, impervious surface lock coverage. So none of those things are proposed to change with the petition to rezone. The petition to rezone is simply to allow for more than three dwelling units. In addition to the petition to rezone, the applicant is also seeking a variance to increase the maximum, or I'm sorry, to reduce the minimum front yard setback along France Avenue South. Site plan review is required for the new construction of the multiple family dwelling. And then finally, the applicant is seeking um, uh, application to increase the um, maximum height from three stories to four stories in the corridor three built form overlay district. The subject property is located along France Avenue South, which is, shares a border with the city of Minneapolis and the city of Edina, um, Edina to the west. Properties immediately in the area are uh, predominantly low density residential uses. However, there's an early childhood learning, se learning center at the north end of the property, that property zoned OR1. Um, and then there was also a property nearby at 51st and Ewing that was recently rezoned from R1A to R4, and that was done in 2018. Public comments have been received for the proposed project, so we received one email uh, ahead of the application that was included with your uh, original staff report packet, and then one additional public comment was provided in the public record for today. Staff is recommending approval of the requested land use applications based on the following findings. First, staff finds that the proposed rezoning of the properties from R1A to the R4 multiple family district are consistent with the comprehensive plan. So staff has identified the four goals here on the slide and is also included um, in your staff report on pages three through, I believe it's seven, three through six. In addition, staff has identified four policies where this project is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The property has a future land use designation of urban neighborhood, which is consistent of, you know, for residential uses, it's predominantly a residential use um, designation. The property is also a block and a half south of the 50, uh, 50th Street West uh, goods and services corridor. So although not directly located on a goods and services corridor, that type of land use feature and proximity to uh, the development would encourage for uh, higher density residential uses. And then uh, the built form guidance as well as the zoning classification is corridor three. Um, the guidance here is to allow for building heights usually of one to three stories, but staff and the city planning commission can consider a taller building up to four stories in this district uh, by finding that the project is consistent with a comprehensive plan. And we'll get into um, how they intended to do that here in just a moment. The applicant is also seeking a variance to reduce the front yard setback along France Avenue South. This drawing was included in your packet and it shows um, kind of the layout of the properties along France Avenue. <coughs> so when establishing a front yard setback, there's two different requirements and it's the greater of the two. The first is uh, the district setback. The district setback in the corridor three district is 
15 feet, but that will increase. And it's based on what we call a string test. So we connect the corners of the two adjacent residential structures. So when doing that, you can see the property to the north, which on this plan is planned to your left of the proposed development, is set back quite a bit further. So that increases the setback to approximately 44 feet, four inches. So the structure as proposed uh, steps back and kind of closest at the south, the, the closest projection is 14 feet, 10 inches. Staff is recommending approval of the requested variance, finding that practical difficulties exist, including the location of the adjacent dwelling, the lack of a public alley. Um, let's see. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, and the irregular shape of the parcel. So historically, there had been a vacated alleyway at the rear of the properties, so the property actually loses a little bit of its corner at the southeast corner. Um, so it, that property belongs to the adjacent property owner, so the applicant's working with an irregular shape parcel. Staff finds that those constraints have led to the practical difficulty for which the variance is sought and not created by the applicant. Staff finds that the proposed variance is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance. So the spirit and intent of the ordinance is to uh, minimize conflicts among land uses, to provide open areas, um, and, uh, and provide more light and air for adjacent land uses. So the intent behind the reduction in the front yard setback is to create a greater separation to those properties to the east along Ewing Avenue South that are um, single and two family structures. The applicant has provided some uh, drawings about uh, the visibility and the, and the setback on the upper floor um, that for, and, and um, shadowing studies that further show that the proposed setback is a reasonable request. Lastly, staff finds that the variance to reduce the front yard setback will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the vicinity or alter the essential character. Um, staff finds that the site plan responds well to the adjacent structures being set back further at the north to kind of reflect the um, dwelling to the north and then brings it much closer along uh, the south end and it responds well um, with those structures. Site plan review. Um, the applicant is only seeking alternative compliance for canopy trees. There are a number of trees proposed. They're all deciduous, but they don't quite meet that height and width for a canopy. Staff is recommending alternative compliance just because of the quantity of the landscape materials. Um, but other than that, they are meeting all of the other requirements in site plan review. The administrative height increase is required in the built form overlay uh, corridor three to add that additional story. Um, the applicant is proposing to comply with that requirement by purchasing REC credits or renewable energy credits. So that's our environmental sustainability cultural resiliency standard. Um, so 40% of, or not less than 40% of the electricity usage shall be derived by purchase of these REC credits. We've had one project do this so far, so we know it's a, a program that can be done successfully elsewhere. Um, I think that concludes my presentation for you today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Um, just one question, and I might have missed it in the staff report, but I don't think I did. Does this include any affordable housing? The proposed project is 28 dwelling units. So when the city of Minneapolis adopted our inclusionary zoning policy, we did a phase in for what we call smaller projects. So that's projects that fall within the range of 20 units to 50 units. Um, as of last count, um, we have permitted 308 dwelling units within that range since we adopted IZ or inclusionary zoning. And so once we hit 500, we're going to notify the world that we're starting a clock for six months, and then at that point, the minimum requirement to trigger the inclusionary zoning goes from the current requirement of 50 units down to 20. So it's a long way to get to, no, they are not providing inclusionary zoning units, and they are not required to provide them either. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Marwa. Hi, yes, I have a quick question. In the um, feedback we received, the public comment in the email, uh, there was a note about that the, it blocks the proposed property neighbors. Does this setback now kind of clear that up, basically? 
Um, I think that the applicant might be able to best address that comment. Um, the applicant has met with uh, property owners to the east, and I think that they could probably do a better job of characterizing that, and I believe we may have some of those neighbors here present as well today. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions. So we'll you. open up the public hearing and start with the applicant. Um, if you want to come forward to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record. Thank you. My name is Alex Giese. Um, address? They're saying neighborhood, but I'll take an address. Uh, uh, actually, um, I live at 5605 Vernon Avenue, or Tracy Avenue in Edina, Minnesota. Not far from the uh, subject site here, just to the west. Um, so thank you, President Olson and members of the commission. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be <clears throat> back in person. It's been a while, so it feels a little, feels a little different, um, but here we are. Um, so again, my name is Alex Giese. I am the lead project developer on this project. Um, I'm here with Evan um, Jacobson, who's principal architect at Tushi Montgomery Architects, and um, um, he's been by my side throughout the entire process here as we've gone through several iterations and have uh, arrived at the project that you see before you tonight. Um, I just want to start with a couple of quick thank yous, and, and I won't take long up here. Um, first to Shanna, thank you for your presentation, and also just uh, for all the great uh, collaboration throughout the course of many projects, but this one most recently. Um, Shanna is always incredibly responsive and helpful in guiding our design development, um, and her assistance on this project in particular was crucial as we were navigating new land use and built form guidance and trying to marry that with a newly forming uh, code, code of ordinances. So. That was a challenge, I think, for everyone, and we really did rely on, on her help in just navigating all that. Um, and as a result, our, our proposed development today is quite different from what we'd envisioned going in to the formal process with Shanna, and I think it's in a better place now than probably what we envisioned, um, thanks to her critical feedback and, and that of her fellow city planners. So um, just appreciate that very much. Um, second, um, Ruth Olson, who's not I doubt that she's here, but she was the neighborhood coordinator um, for the Fulton Neighborhood Committee when we started the process. Um, and she was incredibly helpful in helping us begin the process of neighborhood engagement, which was crucial to this project in particular. I know it is on every project. Um, and we'll get kind of a little bit more into that. Um, <clears throat> so she was very helpful in that. And then about you know, midway through that process, she switched to um, becoming a policy aide for uh, for Council Member Palmasano. So then we actually got to re-engage with her as we engaged with Ward 13, um, and it was just a great process, guided and, and helped by um, by Ruth. So so that was very helpful. And um, and to that end, you know, as I referred to, this project has been very much about engagement. Um, whether it was through the formal channels of the various neighborhood committees in Ward 13, um, or direct communication and meeting with surrounding neighbors, um, we place significant value on the input and feedback of, of all the various stakeholders in this project, um, and our project has evolved accordingly. Um, our, our most recent formal engagement was with uh, the Committee of the Whole, so I'm seeing some of you again, um, and um, you know, you. The Committee of the Whole provided very important feedback, which was incorporated into the project, and hopefully you've seen that reflected in the latest version of this plan. So, um, <clears throat> like I said, the building looks and functions very differently today than it did six months ago, and I think that's a good thing, and it's a testament to taking the engagement process very seriously and truly listening to what folks have to say. Um, and I understand that this doesn't mean that everyone's going to be happy with the project at the end of the day, and you know that we're here to discuss that uh, tonight. Um, but I am proud of our efforts, and uh, in the end, I really believe that this project is <clears throat> does honor the spirit and the intent of um, the built form and land use, um, and just you know what the city of Minneapolis really wanted for this corridor. Um, and so I hope you agree. Um, so with that said, I'll answer questions. Um, Commissioner Marwa, I, I, I'm happy to respond to your question. Um, if you wouldn't mind restating it, I think I have a good sense of it, but 
Yeah, it was um, about we had received staff co or comment in our packets about uh, that there was a easement, there was a property line kind of issue, and does this setback now rectify that problem that we? It received? it does. It helps. I mean, there are a number of I'd say challenges with the site, um, which Shanna touched on. One of which is the lack of an alleyway. Um, the other is the adjacent property being set back in, in or, inordinate um, number of feet um, and having to deal with the, the string setback. So our intent here was to, and, and then third being that the irregular uh, lot size. So the intent was to push the, the, the building forward closer to France and closer in line with the spirit of what we think that the, the intent for the corridor was or is, um, and then away from the neighbors to give a buffer um, a much needed buffer to those neighbors on Ewing. So, and those were the neighbors that we spent the most time engaging with and, you know, just trying to help them understand that, um, you know, although they might not love this, the idea of a project here, we were trying to put the best project forward for them, so. Thank you, that answered my question. Um, and I do actually really like how you've done that setback. I feel like the massing feels a lot less dense the way too with um, as it's kind of flowing in from the single family neighborhood into it. So I actually think that was a very smart move that you all did architecturally. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Ford. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> is the result of all that adjustment to the, to the lot and so forth that there's no problem with this easement that's been alleged now? We don't have an issue with the easement. Well, but does, does uh, Christina Peterson have an issue with an easement? She, she, in her letter to us, she says that there's an easement that is being violated by you. Um, I don't. Am I misreading this, uh, this comment? I'm not. Oh, yeah. So easements, generally speaking, can either be through two private property persons, which is the case here, or the city of Minneapolis could have an easement, such as a public alley. So uh, private easements are between two property owners. When applying zoning regulations, we work within the boundaries of the, the zoning lot or the parcel. So the purview today is based on the site plan and the, in, the, the provided information today. And any um, identification of easements now or in the future would have to be adhered to and agreed upon between those two private properties. But before you today, the site plan review um, and additional applications, again, are within the purview of the, the bounds of the, the lots themselves. Well, I, I understand that. It's not formal, this issue is not formally before us. I am, however, curious to know if, if, it's, if it is in fact true or um, is it in dispute or, or what? Thank you, by the way. Um, this this is the, honestly the first time that I'm hearing okay. about an issue with, with the neighbors, e with the easement, so. Okay. I, Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, thank you. Uh, we will now open the public hearing to any residents who would like to Come up and speak. Um, if you can come up to the podium and state your name and address for the record and go ahead with your comments. Hello, I'm Doug Terex. I'm at 5124 Ewing behind the property with these fine gentlemen. Um, uh, I just want to start out by saying we did meet with them twice, uh, at, and both times we objected to the build size, massing of the building. Um, we uh, disagreed with the fourth story, the third story, the mass. Uh, of that would be much better for this build. Uh, we have a uh, set of nearly unanimous opposition for the properties within 350 feet to this massing of this building. I'd like to submit it if you can accept it. Sir, if you, uh, if you forgive me, um, approach the commission. Thank you so much. I'll pass it up. So there's two pieces to it. The first one is uh, is about the, um, the the finding about the rezoning, and in that case, um, the disagreement is whether or not it's consistent with the uh, policies, the comprehensive plan. They did list some in the in the listing of that it provides jobs or whatever and a few other things, but to say it's consistent with the spirit 
of the comprehensive plan is pretty far from the opinion uh, of, of a lot of people who saw it. So currently it's on the property of, of two houses that are uh, what do you call naturally occurring affordable housing. That's some of the language from the comprehensive plan itself. Uh, it's one of the policies of the, of the plan. Um, and those people are being forced out so that we can take, it's taking away affordable housing and building in no affordable housing. Ripping the news from yesterday's highlight, uh, from yesterday's Star Tribune, we saw uh, uh, Jennifer Ho talking about the crisis we have with affordable housing and saying it's a crisis and we need to have systems to handle that. Uh, Minneapolis has those systems. It is to build out affordable housing at, when we have opportunities like this. Uh, so there are five uh, things. I mean, if you talked about the spirit of the comprehensive plan, you could say it has to do with uh, environmental issues of which they have, I think, built right up to 70, uh, mid-70s of impervious land. So they're not really trying to get a lot of water in the ground. But you can say that they're trying to hit other issues in there. But the five that I saw that seemed to be the theme of the comprehensive plan, number 33, affordable housing production and preservation. It says, preserve housing that serves the lowest income and retain naturally occurring affordable housing. Doesn't do that. 38, it says, we want affordable housing near transit and job centers. It is near transit and job centers, but it's not providing affordable housing. And there's some sub points there saying you want to make make affordable housing along transit corridors. There's 37, mixed income housing. 39, produce more affordable housing. 43, prioritize affordable housing and prevent displacement. Uh, the theme, when I read it, isn't, uh, that is the overwhelming theme of the, the plan in yesterday's news. And I think building in more of the same properties, we're probably at a point of being at a glut. We have uh, Nolan Mains, huge place that's built, not filled out. The one they mentioned, at 51st and Ewing, the three-story place that no one had a problem with. It's beautiful, it fits into the commercial node. The same people who signed this unanimously opposed to this, none of them were opposed to the one one block away. Three stories built, tucked into a commercial node. So we think that the uh, it is not consistent with the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan, which is a, a major finding of this. The other one is uh, one of the major findings is that existing use of property uh, uh, is within the general area of the property in question. It's, it's similar, it fits. You can see it, you can look at these drawings and you take the site plan and you see it doesn't fit. It doesn't take a lot to see that. It's a four and a half story building. I think it technically there's somehow a four story building, but there's nine steps up to most of the units and it's about five feet up for the parking. So we'll get to that because they're claiming a parking benefit. I think parking has to be completely below ground to get credit for that. So I think they lose 0.3 on FAR and it's not submittable the way it is. But let's get back to the, um, whether it uh, it's fits into the neighborhood. Fun fact, within 350 feet of the neighborhood, more than half are one story buildings, the rest are two. So it's a bunch of one story and two story buildings, houses, old houses from the 70s and when they rebuilt Ewing. And if you drop in a four and a half story building in amongst all that now, when there's only one thing at one corner, this is not the commercial node. This is a quiet block that maybe someday in 2040 could have some affordable housing on it or some other housing, maybe a three story housing even. But a four and a half story building today, 2022, on a place that has no other development, it does not uh, fit into the existing property and zoning classification within the general area. So we just feel on two of the major findings that it does not seem to fit at all, a comprehensive plan nor fitting in. Also, there's been no change in the character of this block. It's the same houses, single family houses. We don't think it really hits into the fifth finding. And we also do think if we do give a four and a half story building to a developer, it seems to be for the profit or to the, to the benefit of a single property owner. So we think four out of the five are clear no's on rezoning at this time, this way, for this property. Uh, we are in support of the three-story one around the corner. No one opposed it. We like the one in Nola Mains, tucked in the commercial note. No one opposed it. It's building it on this block at this time, in this place, in this way. We had them over twice. We told them, don't build a four-story. Build a little bit smaller. They went to seven feet on both the north and south sides. They went to, we think, uh, they should have been 15 feet because the back properties walk out. That's really their front door. They need 15 feet. They have 12 feet on one side. We, they got a variance in the front. They went to minimums on the side. Impervious land, almost a minimum. Every huge thing you could possibly do, 
they went for it and they didn't get our input. So if they say they, they like their engagement process with the neighbors, 100% uh, of the neighbors will tell you that was a fun process. But So we think that there is a place on this property and there are other investors, I know of other investors, who would be happy to come in and make something that's right sized. So that's our, our first um, bit. The second thing is on, so we definitely 100% oppose. If you could pack it up. it up, yeah. Well, there's a lot here because uh, I think the premium, the renewable, just to come in in spirit and say we're buying renewable energy credits to get us off the, off the chart and say we want the premiums, the findings are that you have to be in the spirit of the, uh, um, of the spirit of the, the comprehensive plan. I don't think that was a spirit. Somebody buys their way in. Um, and then they say parking. Parking is, has to be 100% below ground. This is five feet above ground. So I don't think they get the point three on that. They're at the maximums, record-breaking maximums for the neighborhood. According to the comprehensive plan, this would become the record uh, build for, for the FAR. But um, so, so we think that's a required finding that you see that it, it, uh, it is allowing, um, uh, in order to get the premiums, not only do they have to check the box and say we got the energy credits, but it also has to be your opinion that it's in the spirit of the, 20, uh, the comprehensive plan and that it uh, also further achieves the goals. The, what does it say? That the increase in height uh, is, let's see, what did it say here? Uh, the, the exceed three stories and eva the evaluated uh, request to exceed three stories will be evaluated on the basis of whether or not the taller building is a reasonable means for further achieving the goals. So three stories could have achieved it. Only thing the four story does is maximize the profits, but it doesn't help the neighbors and it really looks wrong in this property. So we live behind it. They have the shadow studies. You'll see from five o'clock on, we're in shadow. That's another thing, of course, nobody wants that. You didn't have to build it. You could have set back the third floor, and we'd get about another hour per day throughout May through August. So that's a, that's a real thing. So uh, someone reaching and then overreaching and then overreaching again seems to be not the good neighbor that we look for. I think it does not pass the smell test. Um, there's other things with the um, uh, setbacks. Uh, I did mention that. Um, I've got a lot more, but uh, the neighbors in general 100% oppose this on both the grounds of the of the rezoning and of this particular site plan. So, if you have any questions, thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else here to speak on this item? Okay, can I ask questions? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, um, I, I find your argument uh, pretty compelling about the uh, uh, compliance with the 2040 plan. Um, uh, and the, and the cons I'm concerned about the uh, tearing down of affordable housing to, a, uh, to put in market rate housing. But um, am I not correct that if that you're willing to accept a, the, the three-story building and, and smaller footprint, and move, adjust, making the adjustments you talked about, but that wouldn't achieve any additional affordable no, housing? No, preferably right? there would be an affordable complex that was three stories that was built to scale. I'm sorry, big uh, preferably, it would be a, a smaller building at this time in history. A smaller building that would fit, that would have affordable housing, um, would be the ideal. And it, whenever the the neighborhood starts to, they've done two other buildings. This is an aside, but they built two other buildings that were fill in, where they took out a, a houses and built in, and they were already next door to them. Were bigger buildings, so apartment buildings on either side, at Currens and at Turtle Bread. This is totally the opposite. If you were building affordable housing now, I wouldn't even think that would be great at four stories. But there would be a better argument to say, if we said we needed to go to four story to make it affordable, to get affordable housing in there, I would be compelled to think that makes more sense. I wouldn't say just a fourth floor for no good reason, but if, you're, if you told me that was the only way we could put affordable housing, I might think that that's a compelling argument. But other than that, I think- But, but you were saying, were you not, that um, you would accept uh, three stories of market rate housing? We'd prefer that they have affordable housing that the city needs. Well, I know needs that, but, you, but you're, you're willing to accept? Well, of course. And we, the one up, uh, one block away, we all kind of thought was built to scale at, at 51st and Ewing. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I have a, just a point of order question. Um, the public hearing is not really supposed to be a negotiation with the neighbors, correct? So maybe we should hear the public comment and then comment. As, not really a comment. For the, for the negotiation. Yeah. All right. Is there anyone else who's here to speak on this item? I'm, I'm excuse me. I, I made me some, 
Was, was I just told I shouldn't be asking questions? You can ask questions of um, the residents, I believe. Okay. Um, it was just, I think Com Commissioner McGuire was just saying it felt like a negotiation. Well, it wasn't, it was a question. Okay. Thank you. Are you here to speak on this item? Is there anyone else? If everyone, everyone who's here to speak on this item could raise their hand. Okay, just one more. Um, state your name and address for the record. Sure. I'm Mary Sam. I live at um, 51. Um, 16 Ewing. Um, I've never met these people before, but my house is like right on their back property. Um, I want to thank Doug for digging in so much to figure out how this was going to impact the people that are right there. Um, I've never been to a hearing like this before, so I don't know what else to say other than thank you to a wonderful neighbor who's put in the effort to um, try to preserve the beautiful neighborhood that I just bought a house in. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? All right, I'm not seeing any, so I will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, any discussion, or would anyone like to make a motion? Commissioner McGuire. Thanks. Um, since we saw this at Committee of the Whole, um, I do appreciate that the applicant moved the building further towards the road in order to give the residents behind them more light and airflow, as well as trying to shield that with fencing and landscaping, so it's both like, hard and softscape. Um, I do think it's with the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan and find that um, multiple multifamily units would be more affordable um, for residents versus two single family homes, um, especially in this neighborhood. I think we need to provide opportunities for everyone to live in this neighborhood because it hasn't really been traditionally very um, there have, hasn't been a lot of housing opportunities near this intersection, so um, I would support the project. Thanks. And I would be willing to make a motion on that. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments. I'll say I agree with Commissioner McGuire. I think that the applicants have responded to the existing conditions in the neighborhood well and thoughtfully. Um, I think it is in the spirit of the comprehensive plan, just because something doesn't meet every goal of the comprehensive plan doesn't mean it's not in the spirit of the comprehensive plan. Um, and I think staff have laid out their findings well uh, for this project. So I will also be supporting the project. Um, I think that the comprehensive plan can be a matter of interpretation, which is clearly what we're seeing here. And, um, and I agree. Um, one of my big concerns is, is about the community. So we're hearing two very different stories on the engagement level with the community and the community doesn't feel like they were engaged with. And while that isn't something for me to support or not support, I just want to make a note of that because I think it's really important. Um, it's not only important for the success of your project, it's, it's important for the success of the neighborhood. So if you can consider revisiting that in some way or um, uh, making them feel heard in, in a better way, that would be appreciated. Commissioner Campbell. I'd agree with that. And I, I would also add that, you know, our job here is to determine whether or not the, the items before us fit within the comprehensive plan. But I also do think there are important components within it that prioritize neighborhood engagement. Um, and I'm new to the, to the commission, and this is the second time we've seen there be a large discrepancy between what we're hearing from the developer and what we're hearing from the neighborhood. Um, I tend to agree that this, I believe, does meet with the existing goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, I would say that it would be advantageous to the developer between now and further um, legislative hearings before the city to improve upon the relationship that you've had with the neighbors and do uh, what you can to live up to expectations within the comprehensive plan that do prioritize um, neighborhood engagement. Anyone else, or would someone like to make a motion? Commissioner McGuire. I'll make a motion to adopt the, the um, A, B, and C for item seven as presented in the staff report. Is there a second? Second. Second. Marvel. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. 
Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Fayola. Abstain. Commissioner Ford. No. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. So that's five yeas, one nay, and one abstention. I didn't, did I vote? <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, Chair Olson. Okay. How would you like to vote? I'll, I'll vote aye. Okay, yeah. so there'll be six ayes, one nay, and one abstention. Thank you. All right, that motion passes, and those applications are approved. Thank you. Our next item for discussion is item number 10, 1500 James Avenue North, and staff is Peter Crandall. Good evening, commissioners. Peter Crandall, senior city planner with CPED Land Use. The project before you for this item is located at 1500 James Avenue North. This is uh, the North Community School. It's a public school, part of the Minneapolis public school system. Uh, it's on an existing parcel that is uh, approximately 420,000 square feet. So that's nine and a half acres in the near north neighborhood of Minneapolis. The applicant is here today to propose an approximately 40,000 square foot addition to the existing school building. Um, you'll see on the zoning map here that the current site is zoned for the R2B multiple family district with the built form interior two overlay district. Uh, this is the site removals plan that shows the existing conditions on the site. So you'll notice that the bulk of the existing school building is organized into two main masses with uh, uh, space in between. That is primarily the result of an existing sanitary sewer underneath a formerly vacated public right-of-way that runs through the middle of the site. Um, the applicant, as a part of this project, will be removing and relocating that sanitary sewer to the western portion of the site in order to facilitate the addition at the center of the block. And this is the site plan showing the proposed addition and site improvements. So you'll see that the bulk of that new building mass is located in between the two existing school uh, buildings, and then there are several site improvements proposed around the existing structure adjacent to 16th, um, Knox, and 14th. Uh, most significantly, an expansion of the existing surface parking lot and some additional pedestrian right-of-way and entryway plazas on the north and south sides of the site. This is an illustrated plan that shows the new and existing portions of the building, the new portions being highlighted in red. Um, another uh, addition to the building is proposed at the northeast corner of the site, which is currently the existing gymnasium. The applicant's proposing to reconstruct that gymnasium in order to establish it as a storm shelter for the school. And then this is the proposed landscaping plan that is a part of the project. Uh, elevations showing the existing and proposed additions. This is the elevation for that proposed gymnasium and storm shelter. And then some renderings of the proposal. So the applications required for this project would be a conditional use permit to construct that addition to the existing K through 12 school. Uh, there's a variance to reduce the minimum front yard requirement along Irving Avenue North, and that's for an addition to the electrical room. Um, it's a small addition on the east side of the existing structure. There is a variance to increase the maximum impervious surface coverage from 45% to 79%. A variance to increase the maximum number of vehicle surface parking stalls on the site from 100 to 260. 
and the site plan review for the addition. There's also a variance that was noticed that we are proposing to return for the minimum corner side yard requirement. So I'm gonna go over a couple of conditions of approval that staff has recommended in relationship to some of these applications because I know that the applicant is here to address those and to potentially propose some alternative compliance. So with regard to the impervious surface variance, staff is recommending approval of that variance with two conditions, that the applicant shall work with public, service, with public work staff to find additional opportunities for on-site stormwater retention and treatment, um, and that the surface material in the entry plaza and the learning plaza, those are the two kind of main entryway plazas on the north and south of the site, should utilize pervious uh, pavers or other pervious material to reduce that requested impervious surface variance. This is a, the plan showing those two areas that we're calling out specifically for impervious pavers. Uh, with regard to the site plan review application, there is a general landscaping and screening requirement for the site that would call for a minimum of 48 on-site deciduous trees, deciduous canopy trees, and 475 shrubs. Um, the applicant is not proposing to meet that minimum requirement. They are, just gonna find the numbers here. Uh, the applicant's proposing 40 trees on site and 173 shrubs. So we're, we're proposing a condition of approval under the site plan review requirement that they meet that minimum requirement. And then for the parking lot landscaping and screening requirements, which are also a part of site plan review, you know, the applicant is proposing to expand the surface parking lot on the site quite significantly above what is the maximum allowed on any zoning lot and they're not proposing to meet those minimum screening requirements in their current landscaping plan. And this is a graphic showing those locations. So on the north and west side of the proposed new vehicle entry turnaround and parking lot, they are proposing to meet that landscaping requirement. And then there's a couple of areas along Knox Avenue and along 14th Avenue where they are deficient in the required screening for a surface parking lot between the public right of way. And then for building design and visual interest, we're proposing a condition that the applicant should meet the minimum visual interest requirements with additional windows and that proposed gymnasium addition. So that would require at least one window every 20 feet to break up potential blank walls on the elevation. This is the location of that. And then the elevations in question. So I will pause there, I can take any questions, and then I know that the applicant also has a presentation that they'd like to make with regard to those particular conditions. Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions for staff? Yeah, hi, Peter, I have a quick question. So on the visual interest component, having making them have windows on a gymnasium seems a little bit like not the, if that's not the use, doesn't need windows, you know, and we're telling them that that's the only way to do visual interest is through windows. Is there ideas that the city's proposed that instead of windows, what are other visual interest aspects that they could do? Because there's many that they could do that do not have to be windows on a gym. Absolutely, yeah, there, there are other options for that. Windows is, I think, the most commonly employed one, and um, we do have a general window requirement that would require significantly more windows, up to 30% um, for non-residential uses that face a public right-of-way or an on-site public pathway. So that is significantly more than this condition would require, probably, but Again, there could be other potential solutions that the applicant might have ideas about or if the commission has thoughts about, there's lots of ways to meet that for sure. Oh, Commissioner Baxley. Thanks, Peter. Um, is the storm shelter a requirement of the city or is that something that the client is proposing? I mean, I think it's a good idea, but is, is that a city requirement? Or? It's not a requirement of the zoning code, so it may be a building code issue or just a programmatic issue with the public schools, but I'm sure they can speak more to that. They will, thank you. Right, I'm not seeing any more questions, um, so we'll open the public hearing. Um, were you, wait, were you not done? 
I, I'm we're done. Okay. I'm just gonna call up the applicant's resume. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll open the public hearing and ask the applicant to come forward first. Thank you, uh, President Olson and the uh, commission members. Um, my name is Kurt Hartog. I'm the executive director for Capital Planning, Construction, and Maintenance at Minneapolis Public Schools, 1250 West Broadway, uh, here in Minneapolis. Uh, thank you so much for your your time and attention. Is there? A okay, thank you. Uh, just a quick overview: Minneapolis Public Schools. If you're not uh, uh, familiar with the school district, we have 72 buildings, over 8 million square feet of uh, educational space in the city of Minneapolis, about 400 acres of land, and uh, with that land, we use a for a lot of different things, right? We've got a lot of solar projects that we're going on right now. We have 23 solar installations. This project in front of you is part of a solar garden for the north side, the north side community garden that we're gonna continue to expand on the north side. And of course, we've got significant rain garden assets all through the district, um, including this site. Um, and we have 19 other rain gardens to help us with stormwater control. The project in front of you is the North High School renovation, and it's kind of a re-envisioning of North High School. Um, we, uh, the Board of Education directed the, my department to start that re-envisioning process. Uh, it includes a new safe and welcoming entrance. We've got a new dining experience going in. That's kind of that middle part we're putting in. New teen parent services for our teen parents. They're getting a new area as well. We're gonna construct a state-of-the-art career tech ed center for the entire district. So there'll be students coming all over the district into North High School for this. Uh, of course, the new auxiliary gym, which was mentioned, which will serve as a storm shelter for us. Uh, new studios for KBEM. We have uh, a lot more daylighting. We put a lot of daylighting in this building. New auditorium upgrades. Uh, and we upgraded the ventilation system throughout to improve indoor air quality and also the plumbing system to address some lead and water concerns at the school. We're estimating the construction right around 50 to 60 million. Uh, Krauss Anderson is the construction manager for this project. It's gonna be a community asset for everybody in Minneapolis to use. A lot of good features coming in with this building and this structure. You can kind of see a little rendering of what we're envisioning at North High School. A lot of windows, some open space, kind of a really nice campus for a high school and a career technical education center. So we agree with most of the uh, uh, recommendations made by the planning um, and, and, and the review of zoning. Uh, there is one typo here um, uh, up in front. Uh, we, uh, the recommended motions for item A, B, C, and E we approve of. Uh, and we're requesting the commission to approve item D1. D2 talks about permeable pavement, especially in the uh, entrance and in the, in the kind of our lunch area. Our experience with uh, permeable pavement or permeable pavers has not been positive. Uh, they're uh, very hard to maintain. They limit our ability to manage snow and ice uh, in our schools and in our entryways. Um, and they require a significant amount of maintenance. We believe it falls under item D1, um, that we just wanna work with the public works and, and uh, planning to say, okay, what other options are there? What else can we do here other than permeable pavers? Um, it, it, is, it does create a lot of challenges for us uh, to, on, in the school district. The other items that were brought up by um, Peter uh, were pretty much what we had in mind. We've talked with Peter about those different areas. In item F4, um, we're asking the Planning Commission to approve an alternative compliance to allow for the existing trees to be counted in the minimum requirement of 48 trees. We have 21 new trees proposed. We have 27 existing trees, mostly along the boulevard. That would give us 48 uh, new trees. As you're aware, we're also getting um, um, uh, pretty well devastated with emerald ash borer and we're working to replace those trees as they're removed by the city and the park board. Um, at this site, we have, uh, I believe, 15 emerald ash borer trees that will be taken out as part of this project, and they'll be replaced as part of this project as well. We're also requesting uh, the Planning Commission to approve a variance on the number of shrubs. There are 475 shrubs proposed. We're uh, asking for a variance to 204 shrubs. Our staffing isn't really set up to take care of all that landscaping, unless it's green and they can run a mower over it. Um, 
And so we're asking to, to have that reduced for us. Um, I don't think it's going to impact visual aesthetics or the experience at North High School, but the management of all those shrubs and keeping all those shrubs alive uh, for a very long period of time is very difficult for us and very expensive for us. And so we're asking for a reduction in that amount to 204. The other part was the visual screening uh, along uh, the streets there. MPS does have berms along Knox Avenue and along 16th Avenue for screening. They range from two feet, six inches to four feet. And in those areas, um, we're proposing a variance there to allow that to occur and the other areas not requiring that visual screening. Um, obviously, there's a lot of challenges with buses and cars and everything going in and out with uh, a lot of screening in those areas. So we're asking uh, the commission to approve a alternative compliance to that to have us put in berms uh, and uh, plant trees on those berms. Um, item F7, we cannot meet the uh, code requirements for parking spaces and the tree distance in our spaces adjacent to the school for many reasons. Obviously, they park right up to the school. We don't have a lot of trees there, so we're requesting a variance for parking areas that are adjacent to the school building. The parking areas that aren't adjacent to the school building will have the trees and will have the shade. It's just the, the row that is up against the part of the school building. We just can't uh, meet that requirement. Um, and the other item is item F12. We talked a little bit about the storm shelter and uh, our architect, uh, LSE, is proposing more of an intricate design rather than windows. As you know, windows in a storm shelter are very expensive, very hard to maintain. Uh, they're basically bulletproof glass uh, is what comes, comes out to it. And there are precast panels, and we can get the precaster to put some intricate design, especially facing north or facing one of the roads, to help us uh, make it visually appealing so it doesn't look like a precast panel sitting there versus a window, um, which um, for us would be maintenance challenged uh, to maintain and to replace throughout the life of the storm shelter. With that, that's the presentation from the owner's perspective. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McGuire has a question for you. I do, thank you. Um, this is my neighborhood, so um, I'm happy to see some improvements coming here um, and some investment in North High. Um, are any of your other schools deficient in landscaping and shrubbery? I feel like most public schools are very green and lush and pretty. Um, I, would like to, I would like to say yes, they all are <laughs> green and lush and pretty. Um, we do have, I mean, yeah, there are uh, bushes and there are landscaping. Obviously, from a safety and security perspective, we don't like to have a bunch of landscaping and bushes next to the school because those are hiding places. And so we don't, we don't appreciate that from that perspective is that they're, they'll harbor animals and they, kids can hide there. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, most of our other schools have some landscaping, uh, obviously a lot less now because of the emerald ash borer. A lot of our, you know, we had over 300 trees that were ash trees in the district that are being removed. And we're working with Hennepin County to replace all those. Um, so most, in most parts, yes, um, but keeping a, a green area, lawn area alive is a lot different than trying to keep shrubs and everything else alive. We're pretty good with keeping lawn areas there, um, but the, the, the shrubs and, the, and sometimes the trees um, tend to be problematic for us to, to maintain, especially. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Commissioner Baxley. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with um, you sort of working out those details with, with staff, but I, I really along the spirit of, I mean, we're adding a lot of parking here, and I think um, stormwater addressing that issue through some alternative compliance, getting creative with that, I think would be terrific, recognizing your um, sort of maintenance constraints. Um, however, if a private client said, hey, I just don't have the maintenance equipment to take care of these things, we probably would push back pretty hard. So I know you guys will be able to work out something there. Um, I'm, I am curious about this uh, storm shelter. Did you, was the, is this, um, um, are there not other spots in the building that the storm, I mean, the existing auditorium, could that be a storm shelter? I'm just curious on why it's the end of the building, the sort of most exposed portion is the storm shelter. 
Yeah, and that, that is a building code requirement now for e-occupancy, you know, to, 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 you know, we're adding this many square foot. I mean, we, we got caught in a lunchroom addition where they required that and we couldn't afford it now. Um, and so um, in that addition, I mean, we looked at other spaces for that, but there is a lot of code requirement about ventilation, electrical, uh, you know, it's got to be able to operate when everything else is not operating. So it kind of made sense to kind of make it its own because then you can separate that out. So if you know we lose power in the school, the storm shelter doesn't lose power, um, and so that's kind of the the thought behind you know why we you know went that direction so to speak, um, and and the other part was obviously the requirement for survivability, lack of a better term, in the storm shelter. You know that it's it's got to stand when everything else is gone. Um, and so it just made sense to put it right there because, you know, uh, interior to the building, it's very difficult to in interior strengthen that building in order for it to survive when the rest of the building's gone. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Campbell? Just seeking uh, clarification from uh, something you said in your presentation and then what you had just said in response to a question. Um, you had said in your presentation that the uh, variance that you're seeking to reduce the number of required shrubs is a result of staffing and cost, mm -hmm. but then I just mentioned that it's uh, more of a concern of uh, safety for students and staff. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that we're clear about what it, it, it really, you know, th thank you. It is really both. I mean, obviously we don't want a bunch of shrubs um, around um, because, you know, that creates hiding spots. You know, that, so there's a safety and security element to it. There's, but, but the larger element is just maintaining those and making sure they thrive and, and do what they, th they're supposed to be doing from a landscape perspective. Um, you, know, you know, to be frank, you know, Minneapolis Public Schools just doesn't have the staff to do that. I mean, we, we just don't, that, that, uh, that's a budgetary item that comes out of our general fund. Um, and you know, when, when, when you're asking um, a school district to make decisions around funding and it's, and it's, it's uh, textbooks or it's maintain the shrubs, you gotta make, you know, there's a, there's a balance there that has to happen. And what we're trying to do is in, in the, you know, in my department and facilities is saying, okay, how can I best manage that, that, that landscaping piece without, you know, taxing everything else that's in the system. Commissioner Marwa? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, and I also agree, I think this, a lot of this is your expertise and working with the staff on um, to find, you know, remedies that, that work for both parties makes sense to me. Um, my, my comment though is about the kind of that beautification of that space. Uh, even without windows, I think I'm okay without it being windows, but I think you could do public art on that. That's right next to a park. Think about how inspiring more it would be rather, I mean, I get the landscaping issues and you know how expensive that is and all the maintenance that goes along with that but you could as a neighbor to a park if this building had instead like very beautiful public art on it that was done by the students and you actually worked with the arts program there and and you know made sure that everything was kind of graffiti coded and well mm -hmm. set up and from a maintenance perspective to make sure that that whole wall and that whole scale again that would be on the main road was all prepared and in maintenance and you all did that i think i would be okay with that being part of that um, visual interest component, be okay with you guys even, oh, there, okay, there is some of that. But have it be more dynamic. I think this is a school, have it feel like it's integrated into that program and painted by the kids and be part of that school and be part of the neighborhood, not just precast fiber par panels in different colors, you know. But I think that's, um, I, I would be okay with a little bit less landscaping because I know how expensive that is in exchange for a well-maintained, um, Public art piece. Commissioner McGuire. Yeah, Commissioner Baxley. Thank you. Um, could you just walk through the? I mean, we're not adding a ton of program to this site, but we're increasing the parking by a, a lot, sort of disproportionate to the amount of program we're adding. Could you just talk through the need for parking, the new drop off, the a little bit on the design of why that's important to you guys? Sure, thank you. Um, the west, basically the west half of the building is now gonna be the Career Tech Education Center, which means there'll be uh, students coming in in the morning and then the afternoon. So there's gonna be a lot of movement, a lot more students in there. Um, we anticipate somewhere the total capacity is 11, 1200 at North High School that's going to 
you know, come about. Also on the west side is teen parent services, where our teen parents drop their kids off, they can come over and, and meet their kids during the day, and they're taken care of in teen parent services. So we want to have a, you know, a, a, a place for those people to come and go. Plus, we have to provide uh, parking for all the teachers and all the staff that are in the, in the building at that time. So that's why we're increasing our, our re requesting an increase in parking, just because of the amount of volume that's going to be part of that career tech program and then North High School on top of it and the other programming of, of teen parent services. Thank you, that's very helpful. Commissioner Ford. Thank you, I, I want to follow up on what Commissioner Mar Marla was asking about and the, the windows, and I believe you said that um, you'd like to not have windows and you, instead you have some intricate design, I think it was the word you used. That, that's kind of vague, and I'm curious as to um, what what can you tell us that can kind of reassure us that it's going to be something. Um, I mean, I've seen. Uh, well, I mean, I, I understand the, the the budget problems of the, of the school board, but um, sometimes we just get some pretty unintricate mm -hmm. uh, panels get stuck on places, and I'm I'm wondering what. What would be the process, or what can we expect to see uh, in this in this request for a variance here that you're talking about? Do uh, Ian is our architect? Do you want to? Would you like to address that question? Yes, please do. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you. I'm Ian Simonson, uh, LSC Architects, 100 Portland Avenue South. Um, just to elaborate a little bit more on the precast panel design uh, for the storm shelter. Um, as you can see, uh, the image on the board there, um, we are looking at kind of an intricate pattern. Uh, precast wall panels, they're 10 foot precast wall panels, which um, you know, are, are a primary structural, structural component of a storm shelter. Um, and looking at a couple different finishes and patterns on that precast panel to make it not seem you know, so much like a Menards, kind of your typical run-of-the-mill precast panel, um, but like an acid etch um, and sandblast finishes um, on, that, on that panel uh, to create more of a texture um, and more interest um, on that north facade. And then you can also, you can also see in the corner, um, uh, we're showing a metal, perforated metal screen, kind of wrapping that corner on the northeast side, um, c coming around uh, the gymnasium there. Um, I think there also is an opportunity for that perforated panel, you know, to have some kind of an image um, kind of embroidered within it um, to really create a lot more interest um, and, and also kind of speak to the culture of the school as well. I, I'm, I'm not clear. So we're, we're talking about, um, or are we talking about a concrete that might be etched in some fashion? but it's nevertheless gray concrete or white concrete or whatever. Yeah, so we're proposing kind of a dark gray or black concrete, um, and it'll be finished with acid etch and sandblast finishes, which kind of creates um, a, a, quite a hue range, you know, kind of, a, kind of a light, it'll be from light gray to darker black, so there will be a patterning um, along, along the facade. I understand, thank you. Yeah, I guess... Um, I assume Commissioner Marwell wants I to. I do. I have a yeah. follow-up to that, obviously. Um, so I've, I have a lot of, but then you also ended with saying that you would could etch like a picture in there of some sort of some. Yeah. So you can see in the image. Um, I guess we'll say on the right side of the screen. Um, that would be the northwest corner of mm -hmm. the gymnasium. Um, we have standoff perforated panels. These are standoff perforated panels here. Okay. Um, that'll create kind of a layering effect um, on that metal panel uh, with perforations in it. Um, and what I was saying there is we could look at some kind of imagery um, to kind of embroider that metal panel um, so there is even more interest along that facade. So my, my feedback to you would be this is a high school, right? So you have probably an amazing amount of artists, an amazing amount of art students at a pretty high caliber, there's a high school students, they would be able to do this kind of st stuff to work with you. The amount of money that you would either spend to do this sandblasted concrete or not, 
like you work with an arts program, work with the students in this building. Are you planning to do that? Absolutely, okay. Espe especially for the interior spaces. So I think this could also be an opportunity for that. I think engagement. the exterior spaces is yep. what my issue is, is yep. that this is in a park, it's in a community, it's on a main drag. Work with those students to make this facade look cool. They're the ones who are gonna be the ones going to this place every day. That funding and that money that you're spending to do these kind of intricate things should go to them to be helping you make this facade look interesting. And they have probably more ability than you think and have all the capacity in there. Come go, like this is such a great training program for them. Hey, we're redoing this space. We'd love to work with your art teacher or your design or it's a tech school. Let's think about how we could work on the facade of this together. That's like, that's the community engagement piece that I keep missing on projects. You are in a training facility of students and architects and people work with them and I think, again, we'll be fine with, I would be fine with other changes that you're making if you, if those are the people who are actually represented on this building. Absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Okay, I'll, I'll second what Commissioner Marwa said. Um, I think you know right now when you drive past it, it is just like a really uh, blank wall um, and there's a lot of cool arts organizations in North. Um, I'm, I guess I would be, open to the reduction in shrubs and trees with, again, some like other increased exterior amenities, but um, just wanna be really clear that I, I don't think we should say that North Minneapolis high schoolers are hiding in shrubs. Um, there's a lot, there's shrubs at every school and all of your schools have shrubs. So I, I don't think we should treat North Minneapolis students differently. Um, if it's a maintenance thing, that's fine. I know getting workers is hard right now, um, but North Minneapolis students are not like hiding in shrubs to commit crimes. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Commissioner Baxley. Uh, well said, thank you. Um, I would just echo uh, Commissioner Marwa, and it looks like you guys are at least the spirit of that for art on the interior. So I'm confident that you'll be able to kind of, there's a narrative there for that, that end of the building that really is driven by students that should come through. And I think not taking advantage of that opportunity would be um, um, a shame. I, I think the spirit of the addition, the inside, I know the integration of that, you guys will really do a great job at that, but please do that. Could you talk through the variance around the berming and the screening of parking lot. I mean, we've got some neighbors that are close. We've got headlights that'll be shining into their um, yards. Could you talk about the berming and the philosophy around that? Yeah, and I don't know, Kirk, if you... And where those are gonna occur exactly. So this is kind of an updated site plan. Um, you can see we are looking at increasing the number of trees along Knox Avenue, moving south uh, compared to the last uh, image you saw. Um, it was noted that there is an existing berm along Knox Avenue, um, kind of starting from, I guess, all the way down Knox Avenue that ranges from two and a half feet to four feet in height. Um, so we are looking at planting new trees along that berm, um, and then also to the north side where the new parking lot is going to be located, also berming that as well from that two and a half to four foot range with tree plantings as well. And how about the other parking on the other side of the building? Well, I guess that's, uh, we're not really doing much to that side of the site, so that will kind of remain as an existing condition as far as uh, parking and, and plantings is concerned. Yeah, I guess I would, I, I, I maybe, Peter, that may be the case, but since we're increasing the parking by so much and not requiring walls, that I would really encourage you to sort of treat the, there's, again, a wonderful opportunity of, of, uh, fitting into the neighborhood in a different way with uh, a precedent that you already have around berming and treeing. I think it would seem appropriate that you'd look everywhere for that. Um, and a question for maintenance on, is it pretty much, are you guys doing any alternative ground covers other than just grass? I mean, there's some, again, that's pretty irrigation intensive. So can you talk a little bit about what Minneapolis Schools is doing? Sure, we, uh, we transformed uh, Franklin Field mm -hmm. over by Franklin into a basically an organic field. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is the, I think the second year, could be the third that we're, we're doing that. So we are transitioning 
all the, you know, our fields over there versus our smaller lawns or our, our yep. smaller areas around there. And obviously we, you know, at North, you know, we, we went from grass to turf on the football field. Uh, we added art to that football field too. So that, you know, that we had no problem finding that we just had to find a space for them, uh, in their locker room. So I, I'm, I'm confident that the, the, the wall will, um, receive artwork as the art classes move forward. Um, but, uh, and of course we have, you know, we can't use fertilizer. There's no pesticides that are allowed. Um, you know, dandelion control, I think is vinegar, dawn and, and water, uh, is what we use for, for the maintenance of weed maintenance. So, um, you know, we, we, you know, we're doing what we can, you know, with that, obviously there's always some bug or disease that comes around that we're just not aware of. And, and so we do our best to try to maintain our, our landscaping in front of our schools to give it some curb appeal. Um, and we work with our local site staff to, you know, help them with that, um, with that curb appeal piece yeah. for, for the school. Yeah. Again, I think since, uh, you know, this may be a terrific opportunity to engage that in a different way. So it isn't always turf based. That is, um, something that doesn't require, um, there's a lot of great mixes out there that we're encouraging residents in Minneapolis to use in their yards. We hope that the school system and a new education facility would be setting the example for that. So I would encourage you to look into alternatives there as well. And just to be clear, just because I think it's how you said it, that the wall would accept art pieces from students down the road, which I hope is true. I think what we're talking about is an integrated art piece for the construction of the wall itself. Just want to make that clear. I think you understand that. Yeah. All right. Not seeing any other comments. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Our public hearing is still open. So if there's anyone here who would like to speak on this item, uh, they can do so now. State your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Thomas Pelliff. My address is 316 14th Avenue Northeast in Minneapolis. And I own a landscape contracting company. And I'm very aware of the maintenance uh, of the Minneapolis public schools in their maintenance program. And I would state that I agree with what the gentleman was saying about the constrictions that they have in their maintenance program. It's not like with a private business where you would hire services like that out. It's in staff, it's actual guys that do building maintenance that are maintained in these areas. And, and the, uh, the level of what it would take for this Minneapolis public schools to fit within the conforms of the planning and zoning requirements for landscaping seems excessive. I'd rather see the money go towards the students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? All right, I'm not seeing any, so I will close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, any discussion? Commissioner Campbell? I'll just say, uh, I, I think um, I remain wholly unconvinced that uh, the right solution here is a 160% increase in parking and a dramatic reduction in what's being asked for environmental standards. Um, and, you know, I think budgets are about values, and I think, uh, and I'm more intimately aware of the Minneapolis Public Schools budget than I ever have before as a, as a public school parent, and so I get that, that things are tough, but I do not think it's fair for us to hold residents of this city accountable to standards within our comprehensive plan and allow our institutions to receive variances for the same things. So I just wanted to state that. Is there any discussion or would anyone like to make a motion? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we voting ent entirely on all of the different variances? You can take uh, each item on its own. You can, um, you can strike conditions or modify them. Okay, um, I would like to make a motion to um, I gotta find it in here. Uh, to uh, section F number four, the applicant shall provide a minimum of 48 trees and 40, 457, 475 shrubs on the site. I believe the applicant was seeking a variance on that. I would like to 
um, require the applicant to meet that standard. So you would be proposing um, approving item F and striking condition four. No, the opposite. Right? Oh. Oh, as written. Oh, sorry. Okay. And uh, adopting item F as written. Correct. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Moving on, uh, voting on just, this just one. item F at this Lifetime point. Review. Right. Oh, sorry. And yeah. <laughs> so um, the other item that I think there was interest in discussing or potentially modifying is also a part of item F under the site plan review, which is the visual interest standard oh, for the, the proposed. Next page. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for the um, for the gym edition. So okay. I didn't know if we wanted to Thank modify you for, that either. Thank you for saying something. So. Um, Commissioner McGuire? Yeah, I would make, um, ask the motion and seconder potentially to make up for a friendly amendment um, to work with staff on item 12 to include some component of um, visual interest or art um, during the construction, not after. So um, they need this in order to get approval. We're not just trusting them to do it after the fact um, on item 12. Okay. I don't know how to word that. I would accept. Well, well it's not I mine, but I don't. But can we uncouple it with four? Because I don't want four. <laughs> um, that's a good question. If, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So it might be easiest if we kind of look at each condition yeah. um, in order, in order to make sure that we get the clear direction on what the commission is voting sure. on. Sure. So if we want to move F, Maybe we could just start with number one and then kind of work our way down to make sure that the motioner and the seconder agree on the conditions as they're stated. Okay. That will ensure that Peter has the best direction uh, <laughs> when reviewing this application later. Thank you. Okay, so, we, but we cannot, we can't vote on the conditions individually. You are correct, President. Okay, so we all have, well... We have to have a, a majority that agrees on which conditions we're m moving to move forward with. Okay. So, um, who made the motion? You made the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you're proposing, uh, can you just go through which, which items uh, you would keep or change or strike? I am only uh, proposing, so I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the applicant was seeking a variance on item F4. Is that correct? During the applicant's presentation, mm -hmm. they indicated they wanted flexibility through site plan review. So um, okay. in lieu of a variance, it's alternative compliance. So I think that they've asked to work with staff on item number four. But if I understand the motion is to uh, leave the condition as written by staff and that has been seconded. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you were proposing keeping four, or keeping, well, you're, you're proposing keeping everything, well, including I, 12. Um, I would welcome, I mean, I okay. think it sounds like Commissioner Morrow wants to separate them mm -hmm. out. Um, I don't have an opinion on 12. Okay, so um, Commissioner McGuire's friendly amendment was to, um, to strike 12 or to modify it? I would like to modify 12. I would also be open to striking seven. <laughs> Which they also asked about. I agree with seven. They had asked about that too, right? Seven if we have the nine. correct okay. number of trees, I don't think I really care where they are. All right, so Commissioner Campbell, would you accept um, Commissioner McGuire's friendly amendment to modify 12 um, and are you also um, proposing to, to strike seven? Yeah, strike it. Yep. That's my proposal. Okay. Uh, who, who, who is the second? Commissioner I was Maxey? the second. Would you, um, would you still second that or? I would second that, yeah. All right. So we have a motion and a second to adopt item F, um, striking condition seven, and modifying condition 12. Thank you. I, I, 
what is the current uh, modification going to say? I'll ask Commissioner McGuire to repeat what she said. I would ask Commissioner Baxley for help wording it because I think he said it really well. Of um, can, can I just say before he does that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. You're good. Uh, before he does that, I am interested in getting to the part where you said uh, integral to the construction, mm -hmm. um, not just a paste on thing. So mm -hmm. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, one of you. Sure. In, in, I think kind of in with um, instead of the visual interest component for instead of doing additional windows, if they work to integrate art into that building component into the design from the design phase. Okay. Could, could the applicant put back up the list of requested variances or not the variances, the modifications, compliance. the alternative compliance that they wanted? I think we're all confused on what numbers was that we just heard about. And Peter, you are proposing we approve this, the site plan review as written currently here in our packet. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, but I'm open to the modifications that you're making to 12. And I might suggest that we've gotten a lot of language, I think, on the record with regard to that particular issue. And I think I can work with the clerk and staff to come up with wording and we can double check Perfect. that with President Olson to make sure that yeah. we're meeting the intention there. And Yes, we appreciate That's your hard work. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, if, if I could, I think the, the operative word in 12 that's just is windows like I, I just I, I think if we if 12 just doesn't have window you know it's whatever visual interest it doesn't have to just be windows right yeah I think you understand that yeah I got that for sure thanks Peter all right so we have a motion and a second on the table um, staff would work on our language for item 12 oh sorry Commissioner Ford. Yeah, I, I believe there was a request to find out what were the other Requests oh. from the from the applicant. They're up now. Oh. Let me see. That's staffs. Oh, that's staff. No, that's ah, this okay. is staffs. Did you have um, your PowerPoint? If you could, um, or if Peter could, please. Thank you. Um, there was a slide that had yeah, it was a couple of those. Okay. You go up one slide, yeah. So then, sorry, I have not. Oh, go ahead. How do how do we handle the specific planning requests within the applicant's presentation? if it's not reflected on the site plan review that we're voting on? Do we not at all? So their requests here are just referencing specific suggested conditions of approval. Um, I think they are requesting alternatives specifically here to the parking lot screening requirements, which it sounds like there was a general consensus that we wanted to hold them to that other than striking condition seven, which would is the location mm -hmm. of landscaping requirements. Mm -hmm. So unless you want to make further modifications to the screening that is required under site plan review, I, th I think Leave we have a direction. Can I ask one follow-up cl clarification yep. question, Peter? So, and this might just be me, a reflection of me being new to the commission, but is the applicant seeking for us to make these suggested planning requests now as part of discussion? Yes, if you Got wanted to, okay. to meet their requests, you would have to modify the site, the recommended site plan approvals. Thank you for yep. that, your patience, everyone. Yep, no, nope, that's fine. All right, Commissioner Ford, did you have something else? No, I'm fine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'll put it down. <laughs> All right, well, if everyone um, feels comfortable with understanding what the motion is, um, yeah, any discussion? Okay, um, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Baxley. Could you please restate the motion again? The mo <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the motion is to approve item F, site plan review, striking condition seven and modifying condition 12 as we discussed. Sorry, we're just doing item F, not this. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. We'll get to it. Okay, so I'll, I'll restart the vote then. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Always good to be clear about what we're voting on. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Fayola. Abstain. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. That's seven yeas and one abstention. All right, that motion passes. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Okay, I'd make a motion to adopt items A through E as presented in the staff report to finish this case. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I will say, oh, Commissioner Bax. Oh, okay. Um, one of the requests was um, striking condition two on D, um, which requires the surface material in the entry plaza to be pervious pavers or other pervious material. Um, I certainly am sensitive of the maintenance issues with at least pavers, for example. Um, wondering if anyone yeah. has any thoughts on that. Um, Madam Chair, I'll thank you. Oh, Madam President, thank you. I will uh, uh, move that we strike um, item two. I, I, um, I agree with what you said, and I think that the, the pu uh, public schools are doing a great job on building rain gardens and, and tackling this. Not perfectly, but they're making better effort than most. Okay, so I guess that would be a friendly amendment from Commissioner Ford to Commissioner McGuire's um, motion. Sure. I would accept that since we're putting so many trees in now. All right, <laughs> and, and who is the second? Was that me, sure. All right, so we have a motion and a second to adopt items A through E, striking condition two on item D. Commissioner Campbell? I just, I think it is, uh, in my opinion, when we are doubling, or not doubling, there's a 160% increase in the number of parking spaces. I think it is our responsibility to ensure that we are stewards of the land that this is on. And I, I don't think that, um, that allowing a variance to uh, adjust the impervious surface requirement is, um, is a wise decision considering the expansion of parking spaces. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Bexley. Um, I wonder if there was, I wonder if Peter was gonna say this. I wonder if there's a way we can, I certainly recognize the maintenance issue, but there's a lot of other solutions besides pavers mm -hmm. or the amount of pavers, the amount of concrete um, with drainage gaps, there's lots of ways to tackle that. I wonder if we could state it in a way where they could work with staff to um, provide sort of the spirit of the, uh, and, and come as close, recognizing the maintenance issues, but that some permeability of the surface, however you do it, you work into it. Yes, and I was just gonna add that I have had some communication with the applicant around this issue, and I think there may be opportunities to implement a certain percentage of pervious pavers or some other solution that they've identified that could be covered under condition one. So I think striking condition two doesn't necessarily eliminate those possibilities and we can work together to identify additional opportunities for that too. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Commissioner McGuire? Okay, Are you good? All right. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, to approve items A through E, striking condition two and item D. Any discussion? All right, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. <laughs> Sorry for the, so striking item 2D is to keep? It, the, uh, it, it says, the surface material in the entry plaza and learning plaza shall consist of pervious pavers or other pervious material um, and Peter stated that condition one um, Got it. Would, 
Got it. Yeah. So we're leaving that open. Perfect. So aye. Thank you. Commissioner Campbell. Nay. Commissioner Fayola. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Chair Olson. Aye. That's seven yeas and one nay. All right, that motion passes. Thank you for presenting your project. Our next, uh, oh, Commissioner Rainville. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Before we go to the next item, I, I'm wondering, is there uh, a reason why this not this complex issues uh, did not come before the Committee of the Whole first? This project didn't necessarily trigger the Committee of the Whole standards, and there wasn't a desire on the applicant's part at the time of applying for that. And I think some of these issues came out in the process of reviewing the land use application that um, we maybe weren't aware of when the applicant initially came to the city. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next item is item number 10, excuse me, item number 11, 3225 East Minnehaha Parkway, and staff is, again, Peter Crandall. She wants to know if you have another LaCroix. <laughs> I don't, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you, commissioners. Our next item is located at 32, 3225 East Minnehaha Parkway. Um, this is in the Key Waden neighborhood of South Minneapolis in Ward 12. Um, the subject property is an existing parcel of approximately 40,000 square feet with an existing church building. The applicant is proposing to adaptively reuse the existing church to add 21 additional dwelling units, 21 new dwelling units, and to construct a new two-story residential building on the site with seven additional dwelling units. The site is currently zoned for the R1A multiple family district with the built form interior to, oh, I'm sorry, um, and the applicant is also proposing to rezone the site to the R4 multiple family district with the interior to built form overlay district. Uh, you may recall that this site came before us, uh, some of you may, last summer uh, in June for a comprehensive plan amendment to re-guide the site from the Interior 1 to the Interior 2 Build Form Overlay District. That was to facilitate the adaptive reuse of the existing structure. Uh, interior 1 does not allow for multiple family buildings of more than three units. Um, this is the existing zoning map of the site and an image of the existing church. And then the site plan as it exists today. The applicant is not proposing any major additions or modifications to the exterior of the existing church building. So all modifications to that building would be internal to the existing structure. But they are proposing to construct a new additional building on the site, which you can see in this axonometric drawing. And that new structure would be located on the western half of that existing parcel. There is an existing surface parking lot on the southwest corner of the site. And then this is the uh, removals plan of the site. You'll notice that the encircled trees on the northern half of the site are major on-site um, deciduous trees that the applicant is proposing to maintain um, in the process of constructing that new residential building. And then the full site plan. And then some internal plans showing the layout of those proposed dwelling units in the existing church. These are elevations of the existing building. And again, the applicant is not proposing major modifications to the exterior of the structure. 
And then these are the proposed elevations for that new two and a half story residential building on the site with seven additional dwelling units. So the total dwelling unit count proposed would be 28. The applications required for this project would be a rezoning from the R1A multiple family district to the R4 multiple family district, retaining the airport overlay district, and then adding that interior to built form overlay district, which would implement that comprehensive plan amendment that was approved last summer. The applicant's proposing a conditional use permit for a new planned unit development to adaptively reuse the existing church and to construct that new residential building on site. The planned unit development is a necessary application in this case because the parcel itself is non-conforming to the maximum lot size in the interior two district. So the planned unit development is the main tool by which you can uh, redevelop existing lots that are larger than what would typically be allowed. And it's also necessary in this case because we have two principal residential buildings proposed on the site. The applicant is seeking a couple of zoning exceptions through the planned unit development application, specifically to allow more than one principal residential structure to increase the maximum area of individual buildings, and that is specifically for the existing church building, which exceeds the maximum gross floor area that would be allowed for one building in the interior two district. And then they are seeking an exception to the minimum bicycle parking requirement. Um, and that would be to allow a reduction from 28 spaces to 17 spaces, and then a, a change in the standards for bicycle parking to allow them all to be located in the basement of the existing church building. Uh, we would then have site plan review for uh, the reuse of the building and the establishment of that new residential building, and then a preliminary plat application, which is a requirement of the PUD. Staff is recommending approval of all of those applications. Um, I'll note that the applicant is not requesting any alternative compliance to the site plan review application, so we do have some just standard conditions of approval, but um, other than that, uh, I can take questions, but the applicant is also here to speak to the application. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Um, Peter, could you just explain why staff is supportive of the reduction of the bicycle parking requirements? I understand why the basement makes sense since it's an existing building. Is there just not room to put more in the basement area or are they making up for it with outdoor parking? So I know that the applicant is looking at potential opportunities for more bike parking on the site and they might be able to speak to that specific issue, but the plan unit development application allows them to seek that exception through the PUD by providing amenity points in sort of an exchange for the strict standard. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'll ask the applicant too. Thank you. All right, I haven't seen any, any more questions. Uh, so we'll open the public hearing and if the applicant is here to speak on this item, um, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Chair Olson, um, commissioners, thank you for having us today. My name is Beth Pfeiffer, 5640 Logan Avenue South. Along with my colleague, Mary Shogren, we are an emerging women-led development company. Each of us has over 20 years experience working for other developers, supporting BIPOC developers through our consulting work and supporting nonprofits. We've recently started doing some of our own development work and are really excited at this opportunity. Um, we have another project that's currently under construction in this neighborhood. It's called Portico at the Falls. It's a 20 four unit condominium building that's being built at the entry to Minnehaha Falls. We were also the co-developers of a project that was mentioned by a neighbor earlier tonight at 5100 Ewing Avenue South. It was a three story apartment building that as you heard the neighbors talk about tonight was very welcomed um, by the Fulton community. Um, we were really excited to do this project. It's a passion project for us and when we first went to look at the site, the very first thing that struck us was we can't tear this building down. 
This is a beautiful asset to this community. We have to figure out a way to be really creative and reuse it. And we think that's really consistent with the city's goals for sustainability and reuse. So we had really two main goals when we looked at the project. One was to preserve the building and honor the existing fabric of the neighborhood. And the second was to find a way to do that that provided mixed income housing and a mix of unit types. We are working to do this, as you heard, through a comprehensive plan amendment that this group approved last summer, um, which allows us to use the building for more than three units. If there had been only three units in the building, they would have been over 10,000 square feet each. And really what that meant is any other developer would tear the building down in order to build large luxury homes on the site. Um, we are being really creative in how we reuse the space to really have the different unique features of the original church stru structure shine through. And that creates a mix of housing types from some studios that fit really well within the 1970s education wing of the building to some larger three bedroom units that will have um, new dormers. So Peter mentioned that we really are not not touching the outside of the church with the exception of adding some dormer windows to bring in more light for the units that will be in the vaulted ceiling spaces of the church. Um, we did meet with the neighborhood when we were going through the comprehensive plan amendment and then did a follow-up meeting with them a few weeks ago. One of the really important things that we heard during that process was the desire to keep the mature ash trees that the neighbors have gone to great lengths to treat on the site. And so the placement of the new building on the site was very much carefully considered to keep those three ash trees in place. Um, we also know that parking is always a concern for neighbors, and we did hear a parking concern. Historically, the church since 1940 has included very limited off-street parking, just the small parking lot that we are maintaining on the site. We know that the city does not require off-street parking for the project, but we also understand that people do still drive cars and that they need it. The intensity for the driver use at this building, we think is actually going to be below the demand of the original church, which in its heyday had 120 congregants using the building on a weekly basis. And most recently, the building was used in a portion of it by a Montessori school that had 45 students with drop off and pick up daily. Um, we do know that this is an excellent location for bike commuters and pedestrians, and it is well served by transit with multiple express bus lines nearby and just outside the 0.5 mile distance, it's like 0.58 miles to uh, light rail. It has grocery, liquor, library, retail, and post office all within a two to three block walk. And it is, again, one of the things that we love about this site. Um, I can't remember who asked earlier about the bike parking. Um, it, we think this is gonna be a very bike friendly building and it is not that we want to reduce bike parking overall, it's that the secured bike parking where bikes are enclosed would be inside the building. We will have additional bike parking outside on the site. Those just aren't counted in that 17 secured inside the building. So there will be more bike parking than that, but for our residents who are using the bike as their primary mode of transportation, we're gonna have indoor secured parking for those bikes. We're also going to have um, an amenity in the lower level that allows bike fixing station workshop type use for those. We are super excited about this project and about the mix of unit types and incomes that we'll be serving. It is our goal to provide 40% of the units at, at or below 60% AMI. And we are currently doing this without taking any public subsidy. So with that, I will just say thank you again for your previous support of the project. And I'm available to answer questions, as is my colleague, Mary. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a terrific proposal, and I'm really glad um, getting really creative with the use of the existing structure. I, I, maybe I'm missing it, but I know there's no, you're not proposing any elevators for both the new and the existing. Um, could you talk a little bit about your position? Yes. I know it's expensive, but. Yeah, actually one of the really 
great things about this site and the unique way that we're reusing the building is that we are making, uh, I think over half of the units have direct walkout to the outside. So they're fully accessible through a flat door coming in. Um, we're actually, we have one unit that's required to be fully accessible and that was the original um, rectory where the Reverend lived and it's already an accessible unit, which is great. But we will also be adding many units that walk out directly to the outdoors. So the need for a, a uh, elevator is not required because we don't need to go up to a different floor. Thank you. Commissioner Rainville, did you have? Oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Marla, did you have one? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I'm not seeing any more questions, so we'll open the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, if there's anyone who would like to speak on this item, you can please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Chairman Olson, commissioners, this time I think I'm on the appropriate item on the agenda here. And uh, this may seem like a very unusual thing, but uh, we came in opposition to this project. But after hearing the explanation and seeing how the passion behind this project, uh, we've changed our minds. We actually think this will be a nice addition to the neighborhood. We're still concerned about parking, but I think those issues probably can be worked out. And we're delighted that the building itself will remain. Uh, it is truly a real uh, uh, building that makes that neighborhood have the character that it does. So thank you for your time, and um, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? <laughs> uh, thank you, council members. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was good. Is this really how it goes? Was, is this how you have fun <laughs> on a... I can't believe I sat through this whole thing. Uh, Carl Osberg, 3111 East Minnehaha Parkway. And so I have some questions to start with, if that's okay. And the first is um, this R4. I thought that was for a transit way, and this is a parkway, which is different than a transit way, right? So, I, and I don't quite understand parkway. It's kind of a pseudo park that I don't understand. And it is more and more congested and we're gonna be bringing 29 units to this, this area that we don't currently have with, I think, three parking spots. And I know there is no minimum parking requirement, but it should be a consideration that we should look at, at how it affects the neighbors, especially during a snow emergency route. And so I, I'd, I'd like to, um, I think 29 units is too much, is what I think. And I think, you know, a lesser amount when we, we talked earlier, I think it was 20, 18 to 21, 22, there was some jockeying around. I just think it's, it's being maximized maybe a little too much. And so that's my comment on that. Permeability, I don't know exactly what your percentage is on that. So maybe um, if you could answer my question on the R4, a non-transit way, parkway, I'd like to hear that. And then the permis or permeability, I'd like to hear an answer on that too, please. To, to anyone? Uh, it's not a question and answer, okay. but I, I'm okay. guessing we can get those questions uh, answered later on. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm against it, um, and it's it's really this this four, you know, the two B seems more appropriate for the neighborhood that we're that we're at the R four, and I, again I don't know all the details. I did some reading, and they just uh, you can get lost in that. So um, the parking. Again, I'm against it due to that. It's just, uh, it's not quite realistic. I understand the goals and where we wanna go, but three spots for 100 people or 90 people or so, it seems like it's too much or too little. Um, the, the impact on the parkway, again, with, with that. Um, I just, I would ask you to table this and um, maybe we can work on improving the design a little bit with more uh, input as a, that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Mary Dubois, I'm at 3220 East Minnehaha Parkway, and that was my husband who just talked right there. The biggest concern that I have, and I just wanna echo this gentleman's um, sentiment, it's the parking. This is a, it, it's a beautiful um, Parkway, lots of bikers, lots of walkers, lots of dog walkers, and my concern is where are you gonna put 29, 30 cars, assuming everyone who's in there just has one car. Like it, it's, 
it's the parking and, and that's the biggest issue that I have. And if we can figure out what to do with all that parking, um, I don't have any other issues with it. I think it's great that they're keeping the, the church structure. I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's wonderful. But it's the parking that I have the issue. Where are you going to put all these cars? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Great. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Uh, Commissioner Campbell? Uh, I was just going to, uh, are we in the discussion period now? Yep. Uh, I was going to make a motion to um, accept staff recommendation on the project. I think this is exactly the type of development that we want to see in the city. I think adaptive reuse is uh, great. I think Minneapolis has a very long track record of uh, misusing structures like this. And I think uh, I, th I think this project is great. Uh, oh, Commissioner Rando. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just curious what uh, your thoughts are about this parking issue. Yeah, well, I mentioned earlier about the frequency of use compared to the church use and, and the neighborhood. We do think that this is actually going to be a decrease in overall parking demand from when the church was fully functioning. Um, we do have five parking spaces on site for 28 units. Uh, we also know, and I can have a little diagram I can show, but there is on-street parking on the parkway directly in front of the church and on 33rd. And if we only count the available parking spaces on on our property line, so not extending in front of the neighboring homes. There are two additional single-family homes on the parkway to the west. Um, there are 18 on-street parking spaces that are immediately on the parkway in front of our own building. This is not a heavily used area of the parkway for people who park and, say, go to the lake or park and go somewhere else. Um, in general, we think that the parking around the building will be sufficient. Um, anecdotally, for our portico at the Falls project, which is, again, a 24-unit for sale project, we were very concerned about parking there. It's a very tight site, and we could not fit more than one level of underground parking. And we are installing a car parking system in that building, which stacks one car over another. And we had originally um, decided that we would purchase up to 13 parking spaces car over car parking spaces, thinking that's the demand that we would need. We structured the building and paid a lot of extra money to get the ground deep enough to do that. And we only ended up selling six of them. So we are seeing that people are reducing, um, for sure, multiple cars in households. And again, we do think this is going to be an area that attracts people who want to live in a location where they don't need to be dependent on single vehicle use. Um, and we'll use public transit and bike. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. I actually have a question for the applicant, if that's OK, to follow up. Um, thank you. Um, do, I'm not super familiar with your company. Do you all um, like own and maintain them long term? So if there is an issue and there isn't enough bike parking, would you, would you all add some additional bike parking outside? Yes, absolutely. Situation. Okay. Yeah, so it is our goal to own this building for the long term. Um, we personally are not the property managers, but we do believe in hiring really talented third-party property managers who are professionals who do this. So we will not personally be managing the building, but we will have a great company who does that. Um, and we vet them to make sure that they have a strong track record of maintaining property. So if an issue were to come up, that is absolutely something we can look at. Commissioner Fiola. I just have a question from a data collection perspective. On the for sale property with mm -hmm. how many units? You said 28, 24? 24. 24. And it had one floor parking and you sold six stackables. So what, yep. what did the one floor accommodate? The one? The first floor with no stacks. 20, we had just one per unit without the stacking. OK, so you had 24 mm -hmm. plus six. So you had yeah. 30. So it, OK. Yeah. OK, thank you. And the price range on those ranged from $400,000 for purchase price up to a million dollars. Just to you know, kind of give you an idea of the likely amount of stuff <laughs> that people might have. 
Right. Thank you. I love that you're reusing the church, and I love it that you're conscious of the ash trees. That's amazing. Thank you. Commissioner Marwa? Yeah, I also just want to commend you guys on the project. I think this kind of really fits with a lot of the complaint goals we're seeing. We are not seeing a lot of very fun, inventive projects often, so I really thank you guys for the work that you're doing to really make sure that there is reuse, that there is some very cool fabric, um, keeping those historic buildings, making something that's affordable, making something for renters that's a little bit different, too, in the market that we're seeing a lot of the same in. So thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, I will just say... Uh, I live in this neighborhood. Um, I also am a one-car family with more than one person in it, um, and this is a great neighborhood to do that. Um, there's, you know, grocery stores, hardware stores, um, restaurants, a liquor store, like a, even a clothing store, uh, all right in this area that you could easily bike to, um, which me and my family do often. Um, so I'm supportive of the project. I also love um, reusing the church. It's beautiful. Um, and it's sort of iconic on the street there. So I'll be supporting uh, the motion. Is there any other discussion? Okay, sorry, one more thing. Um, I I just wanted to note that there is affordable in this too, even though they don't have to, and I would like to see that remain, and I appreciate you all doing that too. So I, we didn't talk about that at all, but um, I just want that on the record that I like that. All right, any other discussion? Being none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. There was a motion uh, to adopt staff recommendations. Oh, there was. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Aye. Commissioner Fayola. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. Chair Olson. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. All right, that motion passes. Our final item for the evening is item number 12, 315 and 319 13th Avenue Northeast, East, and staff is Shanna Sether. Welcome back, Shanna. Thank you. <laughs> She's got many oh, hats. Right. <laughs> mask down here. Oh, there you go. Thank you again, President Olson, Commissioners. Item number 12. 12, thank you. Uh, for this evening's agenda is the project known as 13th Avenue Northeast. I'm Shanna Sether. I'm a city planner in the Community Planning and Economic Development Department and a staff planner assigned to the project. The existing properties at 1312, or the existing properties are 1312 University Avenue Northeast, 315 and 319 13th Avenue Northeast, which are two duplexes and a triplex respectively. And then the property at the corner is 323 13th Avenue Northeast, and that is an existing two-story commercial building with Airtay and the Peacock Lounge on the first floor. The property has a mix of zoning, so two of the lots are zoned uh, R2B, two fam or I'm sorry, multiple family district, and two of the lots are zoned C1, which is a neighborhood uh, commercial district. All of the parcels are zoned built form overlay uh, corridor four. The existing primary district for two of those parcels, R2B, allows a maximum of up to three dwelling units. The existing built form overlay district, um, corridor four, allows for a maximum height of four stories. Um, in addition, the built form overlay governs um, a maximum floor area ratio, setbacks, impervious surface, and lot coverage. The applicant is proposing a new planned unit development, which includes the new construction of a four-story mixed-use building with um, 56 dwelling unit, or I'm sorry, 53 dwelling units and a commercial space along 13th Avenue Northeast. That space is about 2,160 square feet in area. The building would also include 56 off-street parking spaces that are within the structure and access from University Avenue Northeast. There's an existing driveway and, and curb cut along University. 
The existing two-story building would remain, um, and the applicant is seeking approval of five land use applications, um, three of which have to do with um, ensuring that the zoning is consistent with the development plan. So the first rezoning is to uh, rezone 1312 University Avenue Northeast and 315 13th Avenue Northeast from R2B to OR2, and then um, 319 um, 13th Avenue Northeast and a portion of 323 uh, 13th Avenue Northeast to um, OR2. So I have a map that kind of best illustrates kind of the proposed zoning. So OR2 on what we would think of as kind of the, the redevelopment site. They're adjusting some common uh, lot lines between parcels, so this kind of shows the Airtay uh, two-story building would retain its C1 zoning, therefore it doesn't put any jeopardy for their existing liquor license, um, so they can remain conforming as a restaurant, and then OR2 for the remainder of the site. Staff is recommending approval of the requested land use applications, uh, starting with the rezoning. So staff finds that the proposed rezoning of uh, the site to uh, OR2 and then also adding the split zoning overlay district is consistent with the following goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. So the goals are stated here, um, one, two, nine, and 10, and then also policies related to access to housing, commercial goods and services, pedestrian-oriented building to site design, and open spaces within a new development. We have some mixed uh, classification for future land use policy here. Um, so starting with 1312 University Avenue Northeast, so that's an existing duplex. It's located on the goods and services corridor, which is University Avenue. Um, the remaining parcels, the other three parcels along 13th Avenue Northeast, are designated as corridor mixed use. So that corridor mixed use designation allows us to consider um, uh, expansion of commercial zoning or, or encourages um, uses beyond uh, just residential that we might expect maybe just in the, in the urban neighborhood district. And then additionally, that feature of the uh, goods and services corridor that also encourages goods and services itself, and then um, also um, um, an increase in density. And then the uh, corridor four is the built form guidance. So just to reiterate, the rezoning here from um, R2B and a portion of the site to C1 to the OR2 district is really to resolve the conflict between the existing zoning classifications and the built form, which here is corridor four. The corridor districts are intended to accommodate higher density than just triplexes for what the site is zoned for on those two kind of L-shaped parcels. So this again kind of illustrates the areas to be rezoned. So the split zoning overlay would also be added as one of the um, overlay districts to the entire site area, and that's to recognize that this is a planned unit development. The two buildings are, are, are connected through that PUD, and because they are not zoned entirely the same, we have OR2 and C1 and they are contiguous, the split zoning overlay is required to kind of recognize that it's one developable site as a PUD. So as I mentioned, this is a planned unit development. So the applicant is seeking exceptions um, only for front yard setbacks along 13th Avenue and University Avenue Northeast. So with the establishment of the PUD, that's 10 points. The periphery yards, five points. A total of 15 points are required for this planned unit development. As proposed by the applicant, they are exceeding the minimum 15 points um, by providing 20 points. And they're doing that um, by providing active liner uses in the parking garage. They have an art feature. Uh, they're going to be doing a reflective roof. There's a shared vehicle within the structure. And then they also have a recycling storage area. The applicant is also seeking a lot coverage variance. Um, this is where, again, kind of the, the illustration will hopefully help a little bit to kind of show there's existing portions of the site that are zoned commercial and existing site parts of the site that are zoned residential. 
So the built form uh, overlay district controls lot coverage and it has different percentages for residential and office residential from commercial and industrial and downtown. But in this case, just commercial we'll talk about. So the applicant is seeking a variance to increase that maximum lot coverage for proposed lot one um, from 70% to 75%. So today in your packets, you received a staff memorandum updating that. Staff is working with the applicant to try to reduce the lot coverage requested, but they are still requesting that variance to 75%. So uh, contrary to the memorandum prepared today that adjusted the staff recommendation, we would ask you to refer just solely back to the staff report that was originally prepared and provided to you last week. So apologies for the confusion there. Um, so staff is recommending approval of granting this variance um, based on the following findings. So staff finds that practical difficulties exist in complying with this requirement for the maximum lot coverage due to the existing split zoning of the parcels and the multiple street frontages. The parcels included in lot one have that combination of R2B and C1 zoning and the applicant is proposing to rezone all of lot one for consistency for that new construction. Um, so portions of that site that are zone C1 are not subject to lot coverage today, but will be in the future. Um, there's approximately 7,200 square feet of that lot one that's zone C1, um, and then the, the increase to get to that 75% is only about 1,150 square feet. Um, and then also, by retaining that existing building, it's creating an L-shaped parcel based on the adjacent residential structures to the north along University and also to the west along 13th Avenue Northeast. It's creating two street frontages where we have additional policies that encourage building this building up. And that is covering the site zoned to be OR2 um, with more structure footprint. So staff finds that the applicant is proposing to uh, utilize the property in a reasonable manner consistent with the spirit and intent of the zoning code and the comprehensive plan. Um, the majority of the site is designated as that corridor mixed use, which encourages commercial zoning where appropriate in mixed use and multi-story buildings. And lastly, staff finds that the proposed variance will not um, alter the essential character of the locality or be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the vicinity. The applicant is exceeding their minimum required yards where adjacent to low density residential along the north and the west. Um, and additionally, the site already has that combination of residential and commercial zoning. The applicant is also seeking a site plan review application. Um, so that's an evaluation of the new construction for consistency with chapter 530 site plan review, chapter 541 uh, parking and uh, loading. And the site plan is in compliance with all of the requirements in chapter 530. So in short, they're not seeking any alternative compliance. So the building as proposed meets all of the requirements. The last application is the preliminary and final plat, and that's just to redraw the property boundaries to kind of delineate between lot one for the new construction, and then the remainder is lot two for the existing two-story commercial building. A preliminary and final plat are a requirement as a plan unit development, so those applications are before you today. That concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Shanna. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Ford? Thank you. Um, the, uh, one of the uh, earning of points was the art feature, which I understand is, is going to be a mural uh, on one of the two walls. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything about, uh, said about the size of that mural? Is there, I, mean, I, I know we shouldn't be designing it here, but is there, is there any kind of understanding as it's going to be a large one or what? The, uh, thank you, Commissioner Ford. President Olson, the condition within the zoning code in order to allow for points to be awarded for an art feature are specific to the valuation of the art piece. So it has to be, I believe it's a quarter of a percent of the project cost. So um, it's the cost that's going to determine the, the, the mural itself and not necessarily the size. But, but has, there, has there been any discussion indicating what it's going to look like or what it's going to... Um, what, what its nature will be at all? So the zoning code is very specific in that we're not allowed to uh, regulate art. 
um, and that typically comes up when we look at signage. And so as far as um, evaluation of the size and, and the type and the message, et cetera, that has not yet been provided to staff, but perhaps that would be a good question to ask the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I sat in on, on a Zoom presentation back, I believe it was in January, uh, the developer game to the, to the Sheridan neighborhood. And could you explain this pocket park issue? Uh, it, it, seemed to, why, it seemed to me that uh, the developer was asking for a different designation of land from OR1. How, how did that ever get resolved? Um. Thank you, Commissioner Rainville, President Olson. I can't speak to the details about the evolution of the pocket park. What I can say pretty, hopefully very clearly, is that the parcel currently that exists, that the, um, the pocket park is to exist on in the future, today is zoned commercial. Okay. As proposed in order to allow for the development is going to be rezoned to OR2. That allows for the park. Um, it allows for the mixed-use building. The park would be allowed in either district. Um, so if they would have, um, were, if they were able to obtain the consent signatures required to rezone the entire site to C1, they could have done that. Instead, they pursued uh, the OR2 district, which still allows for the proposed structure as designed and the pocket park. Okay. Uh, and I have several more questions. So could you speak to... Uh, the obligation of the city, traffic has, has come up, uh, especially university. Where are we standing on that? What's the staff's feelings on, is, it is a state highway. It is a state highway, yes, that is correct. Commissioner Rainville, President Olson. So staff had early communication with um, our public works department about uh, the proposed parking garage entrance being on university in proximity to the controlled intersection. There's a light there at 13th and University Avenue Northeast. They determined that the um, um, that the existing curb cut and the existing traffic um, and the driveway that was the most appropriate location to pro provide um, a parking garage access, and um, the site will be continued to be evaluated through the preliminary development review process. So, if the applications are approved, we'll continue to work with the traffic engineer. In addition, the subject property is, um, as proposed, exceeds uh, 50 dwelling units. Therefore, they were required to provide a travel demand management plan. So that's been included in the public record today and has been evaluated by our traffic engineer as well. So um, as proposed, there would be 56 um, parking spaces available to residents um, uh, within the proposed structure and that evaluation about traffic impacts is included in the travel demand management plan. As staff found, the proposed project would not add substantially to the congestion of the public streets. Um, and it was the applicant's intent to provide some off-street parking for the proposed project. Okay, and uh, one last question, if I may. Uh, the, the issue of shadowing has come up quite a bit as well in uh, public uh, testimony letters. Could you speak to that? Uh, absolutely. Commissioner Rainville, President Olson, um, the proposed structure is four stories and it's less than 56 feet in height. There is a potential impact for a change in, in that built form, but that is allowed by the zoning code. Today's rezoning does not change the fact that the zoning currently allows for a four-story building 56 feet in height. The proposed rezoning is only to allow for more than three dwelling units. There is not a tool for staff to evaluate shadowing for a building that complies with the zoning ordinance. Okay, and, and I do have one more. So, so another issue that's been raised by the residents is, uh, uh, and I don't know if you can answer this or maybe it's the applicant, but uh, the digging or the pounding of the ground uh, because the homes are so uh, old, or uh, is old the right word there? <laughs> they're, uh, they've been around a long time. I'm very tired, it's been a long day. Uh, but could somebody, and if it isn't you, maybe it's the applicant could speak to uh, potential damage to those homes. Um, 
I, uh, Commissioner Rainville, President Olson, I do think that we could ask the applicant if piling, uh, if there is some sort of, um, how they intend to do construction of the proposed structure. There is one level of below grade parking that's provided. Um, the applicant is exceeding their minimum setback, so there is a bit of a separation between the adjacent dwellings um, where that structure is going to be proposed and, and the areas to be executed excuse me, excavated. Um, but as far as any potential damage during construction, which can occur, that occur, uh, the remedy is through the two private property owners. That's not um, part of the city evaluation. There are certainly um, um, anything that would occur that could alter the public right of way. Certainly there is uh, remedies through the city of Minneapolis. But I think the question about how they intend to do construction uh, would be best uh, before the applicant. Thank you, Ms. Sethra. Thank Sethra. you. Commissioner Ford? That's an old one, sorry. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Commissioner McGuire? Thanks. Um, so my, I guess two questions. So it's my understanding that like if this came forward in a year after the rezoning study, um, we would only be looking at the conditional use permit, site plan review, and variance. Is that correct? Um, it's difficult to project exactly what the rezoning study is going to conclude. However, the proposed combination or the existing combination of future land use and built form would indicate that higher density zoning would be allowed. We have properties that are both on a commercial corridor and designated as, as corridor mixed use. That would lend someone to think that commercial zoning would likely occur here, but I don't want to preview something that I, I certainly don't know. Sure. Um, but you could see that based on the guidance, commercial zoning is appropriate here. So. If that happened in the future, I'm not even sure that the planning and development conditional use permit would have really been required. They could have really disassociated the two parcels and just did, um, just developed lot one on its own. And um, the only application that would have been required is site plan review. Okay, you knew where my question was going, <laughs> clearly. Um, okay, so then I guess I'll have a follow-up question about the planned unit development. So it's my understanding that with the planned unit development, so our code lays out specific things that we can and can't consider. Um, I know a lot of other places can have architectural standards and um, I guess like increased aesthetics as part of the PUD for that um, flexibility. Is that something that we can talk about more tonight? Um, or is, would that not be allowed to be discussed under our code? Because um, I just saw some stuff about kind of not meeting the vibe of the neighborhood. And obviously vibe is subject, you know, aesthetics are subjective, but I guess I'm wondering if that can be part of our discussion or if we can't under the code. Commissioner McGuire, President Wilson, I would say that you can certainly tie conditions of approval to the appropriate land use applications if we're mitigating um, uh, either a finding that has not been met or a site plan review standard that has not been met. In this particular case, the architectural design meets all of the requirements for site plan review. Um, and it's staff's opinion that the, the massing is appropriate and we've kind of evaluated that in kind of the length of these staff reports. I'm sorry, I'm not thinking of all of the, the findings related to the PUD, but uh, certainly if we think that there is a finding specific to the planning and development or site plan review that we think would be appropriate, um, it could be uh, suggested for sure. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure I understood what we were able to, to discuss, so thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Thanks very much. So I will open the public hearing and ask the applicant to please come forward. Uh, state your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, uh, President Olson, members of the commission. My name is Pete Keeley, Collage Architects at 708 15th Avenue Northeast. And so um, first I want to thank Shanna for helping us sort through all the <laughs> different lot lines and, and whatnot. I'll try to answer some of the questions and kind of keep this brief. Um, as far as the variance from the 75% to 70%, we went with, in with the intention to actually meet that guideline. What we have found in this is that um, we are trying to keep the property line on the rezoning portion of it, not at a zero lot line condition. We can meet that or come very, very close to that as a zero lot line. And this is maybe part of the uh, conversation back and forth with uh, planning staff. 
And the reason to have a couple extra feet is one to, or have a lot line that changes a little bit is to uh, provide, to uh, maintain some of the windows on the existing building and to provide for a few anomalies in the building, such as a drain pipe that comes out and sticks out a, a foot or so. And so the idea of this was to have a little bit of flexibility in order to make the best use and the best preservation of that existing building. That's why we're asking for the flexibility from the 70 to 75. We did look at reducing that, but um, like I said, there's a few things that are uh, maybe getting in, in the way. A um, couple other questions I th I'll try to answer most of them that I remember. Um, the art, we are planning to do two art murals actually. Uh, one in the pocket park, uh, so the, the west side of the existing building and the north side of the existing building as well. So we're looking at two nearly full-size uh, murals in those locations, uh, working with the, the neighborhood group as well to kind of understand maybe what the vibe is, if I <laughs> lack of a better, a, a better word. But um, So we're looking at those as being kind of painted murals, and I think a lot of this had to do with um, kind of trying to create the pocket park and so trying to activate it very strongly on the west side, but also um, creating the wall of the existing building where it went from the um, kind of existing fancier brick, so to speak, to the common brick on the side. It's existing painted, it's existing kind of just a flat surface now is, is to paint that out to kind of create a, a, a very interesting pocket park um, in the middle along with uh, s some landscaping. Um, and I think first and foremost, what we really wanted to do in this project is keep the building and kind of keep the functionality of that existing building. And so we've kind of tried to work this new building around the existing one and to keep it viable, including kind of the access point and the drive access so that we can continue to pick up trash in a similar manner that happened before. So, um, and then really trying to keep, you know, on one end on the on 13th and on university kind of three-story brick masses on those which are, are pretty close to what the existing building is. So the existing building's around uh, 30, 31 feet. We're at about 34 on the brick portion and it steps back. So I guess with that, um, I think there were a couple other questions. I'm sorry I don't remember them, but um, happy to answer any questions. I do have uh, Michael Pink who is the, the developer on the project here as well and I know he's been through a lot of the neighborhood meetings and has met with a lot of the individual uh, homeowners and business owners along the street as well. So, Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Commissioner Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question was uh, during the construction process, uh, potential damage to the existing homes. Yeah. Um, so the, the existing site actually has a lot of loose fill on it. So at one point it was probably filled in. Um, we have had soil borings and done a lot of testing out there. And so we, in order to actually build the building, we're actually gonna have to excavate a good portion of that, uh, of, of that site for the loose fills. And so as we're doing that, as we're going down, it's gonna be a combination of uh, shoring and cut. Uh, we can't do the entire thing on, on a cut and keep it safe and keep uh, the neighbor's home safe. So there will be a, some cut to a certain point where we're doing a shoring retaining wall. So uh, we haven't gone through the full analysis of that, but we um, certainly very conscientious of not damaging those homes because that is a you know, liability to the, certainly to the project and to the ownership. Um, but those sides essentially on the north side and on the west side, we did pull it back a little further than what was, um, I think the, the, the code kind of says. And part of that was to accommodate more of the soil excavation that needs to happen for the site. Commissioner Baxley. <clears throat> Thanks, Pete. Um, could you talk a little bit about, is maybe a little bit more esoteric question, but um, I, you know, I really appreciate that sort of two, the sort of public realm side of this project, uh, the scale, the articulation, the, um, I guess it's the, the sort of backyard of the two, the west and the north facades, right. um, seem to drop off in terms of detail and material. And, and to be honest, I think on the west side, a big shiny metal west facing reflector into somebody's backyard might be a little tough. So could you talk about the material and how you went about? Oh, oh we got to where things? that was. Yeah. Well, we, um, so obviously there was a lot of work on the, the rest of the, the sides, right? And there's a fair amount of expense on the rest of the sides to create the pocket park, the in and out, the courtyard, the recesses, the step back. So we wanted to make sure that we were kind of staying off 13th and off university. 
So that was kind of the starting point. I think on the west and the, the north side was maybe a little bit more utilitarian, but we did actually step back the northeast corner of that building. So to try to align the very northeast corner with the adjacent home to the north, we also stepped back the southwest corner. So again, it kind of matched the the front, the setback on the of the existing home as well. So we kind of went from the outside, from maybe the esoteric, <laughs> we kind of went from the public side into the back side and, and then tried to find some efficiencies. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, then uh, on that, we did want to kind of create a base to that. We do have kind of the upper level, the, the pieces that kind of stick out as well. Um, I do think as far as the shiny metal box, I do think those things tend to fade quite a bit over time and really dull out. So I don't see it being this shiny metal thing. I see it more as a, a light colored and we wanted to stay kind of in a lighter tone, uh, not try to be too ominous with some of them. There's a lot of dark buildings now and we're trying to keep it actually light, thinking that more light and more reflectivity is actually maybe a better thing. But Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. I, I just maybe a heads up having some past experience with um, anticipated reflectance and actual, um, um, just kind of be aware of that, I think. I think it's a great point. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions from commissioners, so uh, thank you. And we will open or continue the public hearing. So if there's anyone who would like to speak on this item, you can come to the podium uh, and just state your name and address for the record and go ahead. My name is Brad Perry. I live at 1400 University Avenue Northeast. And I really will only be two minutes. I was timing myself today, so we'll get it done. <clears throat> I've lived on the corner of 14th and University for over 25 years with my wife and two children and a brother with autism. I have concerns about the proposed 60 car parking garage with its only entrance off University Avenue and the much increased danger it will present to the safety of our children, elderly, bicyclists, and people who walk. Traffic is already terrible on University Avenue. It's a state highway and a truck thoroughfare that goes to the middle of our neighborhood from the railroad container yard. 13th and 14th are also congested detours. A parking garage with its only entrance off University Avenue will only make this much worse. Congestion will increase and vehicles will seek to avoid this by whipping down our side streets. I'm concerned about our most vulnerable as they attempt to cross much busier streets to and from school, church and other venues. We have three schools in the immediate area, two within one block and the other two blocks away. Drop off and pickups at these schools is already dangerous. On more than one occasion, we have requested a traffic study that addresses concerns about the unavoidable increased congestion and its harmful effects on our neighborhood. All I can find in the proposed plan is it will take into consideration advice from MnDOT and other traffic officials. The developer has provided a minor travel demand management plan that talks a lot about how congestion will be minimized by being biker and pedestrian friendly doing ride share and more. Policy six of the plan prioritizes walking first, followed by bicycling, and transit use, and lastly, motor vehicle use. I'm gonna say that part again. Lastly, motor vehicle use. Building a 60-car parking garage of already busy university does not accomplish these goals. In fact, it will do the opposite, and everyone will be in greater danger. Also, added businesses will increase refuse pickup and deliveries. Another reason for congestion which would be worse with one entrance to a 60-car garage. Personally, I don't need a study to know congestion will be terrible. It already is. It is already a dangerous area. This project will make it much worse. And I know that neighborhood citizens, especially our children and elderly, will be at greater risk. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to? Thanks, Brad. Uh, my name is Thomas Pelloff. I live at 316 14th Avenue Northeast in Minneapolis. Um, uh, the property is uh, directly behind this development on the north side. <clears throat> my family is, I'm the current owner of the property. My immediate family is owned and lived on that property for well over 100 years. Uh, 
as to Brad's concern about traffic, uh, one of the major issues is that this exit is less than a half a block off of the stoplight of an area that's already backed up for three or four blocks <clears throat> to the north. And how is traffic going to get in and out of that is what Brad's comments were the major concern of. And one concern that I have is with that many units, and I saw a, a plan showing their dumpster proposal, how many times a week is a full-size garbage truck going to be having to go in and out of that narrow corridor? Uh, there's an 11-foot setback, but garbage trucks tend to be 18 to 20 feet long. So if a garbage truck drives down that corridor to pick up the dumpsters, when it backs out, it's not going to be able to see pedestrian traffic, and it's not going to be able to see oncoming traffic on University Avenue. And I don't think that that's being taken into consideration. So that's just on the whole traffic thing. Um, <clears throat> I want you to place yourselves in the 13th in university area, if you're familiar with it. <clears throat> Style, character, and charm, more than just the businesses. These are the words of the New York Times travel section used to describe 13th and University Avenue in an article called The Coolest Street in the Twin Cities. Our own uh, Twin Cities City Pages magazine named that intersection. <clears throat> it was voted by the citizens of Minneapolis in their best of section as the best intersection in town. That was from the citizens. This, pro this project doesn't fit within the conforms of the character and charm of this area. And this area was the linchpin in the development of the Northeast Arts District. It singular singularly started the revitalization of the entire Northeast area that's now thriving. And this type of development of multi-unit housing, four stories tall, at the central point of this neighborhood, of this iconic section of 13th and University, jeopardizes the area. And I know that the developer owns approximately eight to 10 more properties on 13th Avenue. And it is my great concern that when we move forward on something like this, it is just the preliminary step to changing the whole entity of the neighborhood. And under the 2040 plan, that is a strong concern in front of you. Um, <clears throat> so in, in the, when I looked at the 2040 plan, <clears throat> and I was listening to, is it Ms. Seether, is that? Seather. Seather. <clears throat> when she put up, my biggest concern as far as the 2040 plan goes is the property located at 1312 University Avenue Northeast. And the 2040 plan calls for multiple overlays to be considered on all developments. And the plan on 1312 University is <laughs> under the land use portion <clears throat> is considered urban neighborhood, not mixed use. And I think that that's being glossed over. And even in the description that Ms. Sether put up in front and on the board, it was omitted of one major final sentence in that that I think is most appropriate. And it says expansion of commercial uses into the sur this surrounding area is not encouraged. So whereas I am 100% in agreement that the zoning changes for the properties on 13th Avenue, 1315, 1319, keeping the C1 on 1323 fits well within the, the, the context of the 2040 plan. The property on 1312 University, under the authors of the 2040 plan, was not intended for the use being proposed in front of you today. 100% is not intended. And so as a citizen, I've embraced the 2040 plan. I'm pro-development. 
I'm working with Pete on an arts project in Northeast Minneapolis. I'm not against these gentlemen at all. I've had discussions with Mr. Pink. But what I am concerned about is at this early juncture when we're just as citizens being asked and you as the council in the board are asking to embrace the 2040 plan, that just right out of the gate, we are making a colossal shift away from it. This project is asking for all sorts of different things to make it viable. And it's my contention to you that it's not viable and mostly because of the 1312 property. <clears throat> um, my concern. I'll have you start to wrap up if you Yep, could, of course. Thank you. When we initially got our letter from the developer about the proposed C1 zoning, um, it talked about, and I have it highlighted here, that the proposed area is less than what is allowed under e either zoning classification. In short, we are not building to the maximum of what is allowed under either zoning classification. And then I get my letter that they're asking to increase the city's requirement for that. And I'm just wondering why we were being told one thing and another thing is happening. It also asked us to, uh, for our permission to seek C1 zoning. And when it became apparent that we weren't for that, they sidestepped it. And they came up with this split zoning overlay. <clears throat> and, and, and my concern is that with the multiple, multiple properties they own on 13th Avenue within a two block radius of this, of, of this development, that they're just gonna circumvent the neighborhood because it seems as though they're doing it now. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry to take up so much time, I know it's late. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Anna Scallon. I live at 1313 Third Street Northeast. Um, I thank the Planning Commission for, I think, probably reading a large document that I sent to you, uh, which included a number of arguments, um, or challenges, rather, to the findings of um, the staff report. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, so we as neighbors, um, because we are good neighbors that are part of a community, uh, have organized together to talk on different aspects of this. Um, I do want to bring back the subject of overshadowing. Um, multiple parts of city guidance call into question um, whether a development will affect the enjoyment of an existing property. Um, and as I pointed out, the, uh, to use Mr. Pink's words, unfortunate thing about this development is that my property would be overshadowed without direct sunlight for eight months of the year. Eight months is a long time, especially in winter, um, I understand now, thank you, Shanna, for clarifying that there's not a tool for the staff to analyze overshadowing. Um, but I know I'm not allowed to ask questions, but I do ask the commission to consider what is the tool for measuring enjoy, uh, enjoyment of a property? Um, because the staff report has said that that is not affected. I can say as a direct neighbor to this property, my enjoyment would very much be affected uh, and I want that to be clear. Um, let's see, so we already touched on, it. everyone asked some great questions, so we touched on a number of things that I wanted to bring up. Um, but regarding damage, potential damage to the property, um, I do wanna point out that damage would be expensive and would be privately litigated, uh, which I think is an important question to ask, uh, or an important accountability aspect for this project. Um, it would be an unfair burden on neighbors if we have to come together and privately litigate uh, due to damage to our houses. Um, I also want to bring up uh, that though maybe within the zoning, uh, they are in, they're aligning with the city policy for the parking. Um, I think it's really important to consider that also in the rezoning, if you're thinking of a commercial property, I've looked at many of the commercial uh, use properties that are in the city of Minneapolis. Many of them have alleyways. Um, a unique characteristic of our block is that we do not have alleyways. Um, so this means that there is a uh, lack of uh, setback um, that an alleyway would provide. Um, that of course affects overshadowing um, but it also is a public safety matter. Um, I brought up in my letter to uh, this commission that 
there is no plan in terms of fire safety, what would be the way if there was, you know, forbid a fire that broke out in the back corner of this property, there's no plan for fire services or emergency services to get to it. Um, and I find that to be extremely dangerous and very alarming. Um, I appreciate your patience with me. I think just to kind of reiterate the point um, that this is, uh, this project is supposed to be bringing something maybe new to the neighborhood. Um, I would point out that there are already retail uh, and offices in the building at 323 University Avenue. There's also a restaurant there. Um, and there are residences at 315, 319th, 13th and 312 University. Um, while the proposed PUD does not meet city goals such as high density housing, or does meet city goals such as high density housing, it does not address goals for affordable housing. Um, it's market rate affordable. We've seen several of these apartment buildings pop up around our neighborhood in recent years. Um, candidly, I would share, I don't think I could afford to live in one of those apartments. And so I call that into question. Um, that's all I'll share for now, but thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question about the fire safety that's really important from my conversations with the fire? I, I will ask that question later, I promise. We'll get it answered. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, Shannon, would you mind um, just uh, telling us how fire safety is determined when a, a project comes through and, and what what happens with that. Yes, President Olson. Um, so the way development review works is that we kind of start in the beginning with some of the other departments and divisions within the city of Minneapolis. So we do a very cursory overview from a zoning perspective of identifying the land use applications that are required and kind of the process. Our colleagues in public works look at a variety of different um, evaluation criteria per their ordinance and standards, stormwater management, traffic, uh, transportation, um, et cetera. Fire Inspection Services is another one of those team members that evaluates a project kind of on the front end to give preliminary feedback. Um, Construction Code Services reviews a building permit for compliance with um, the, the International Building Code as well, um, but their initial feedback is usually more around accessibility. So n now we're kind of in that part of the process where we're evaluating the land use applications. So the applications before you today specifically rezonings, conditional use permit, variance, site plan review. If this project were to be approved, and I don't want to assume anything, that's when we pick back up some of these other departments and divisions to do the evaluation of the criteria. So some of the things that fire inspection services requ require, things like fire alarms, sprinkler systems, um, smoke detectors, and things like that. And then the building will, would also require a construction permit. And that um, construction permit evaluates, you know, that, a sprinkler, whether or not it's required, exiting um, distance, how far, to ensure the safety of all the, the residents within the structure. I'll just again note that this building is not lot line to lot line. Uh, the OR2 district requires that there is setbacks where adjacent to the low density residential districts. Thank you. Thanks very much. Commissioners, any discussion or questions or would someone like to make a motion? Commissioner Rainville? Yes, I, I have a comment and I'm, and I'm going to have a motion. Uh, I, I stand with the neighbors on this. I, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, the traffic issues, fire safety, it's just troubling to me that, that those questions get answered down the road. I, I feel they should be answered in the front. And, for, and uh, <laughs> at the other hand, I understand the 2040 plan. I understand the developer. I see that too. But I'm going to make a motion to uh, deny this. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and a second uh, discussion. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Um, I think this is a really unique project because it's like wedged around an existing building, which is quite unique. I think they've done a good job trying to um, 
increase the like aesthetics from both public roads and I like the pocket park. Um, I do think when I'm looking through the elevations, it's a bit confusing to me um, <laughs> as someone who frequents this area, which if I was driving, which one the pocket park would be and which one the um, entrance to the um, parking ramp would be. If you're just driving, because when you look, they're just kind of both gaps between two buildings. So I think um, I'm in favor of the project, but I would want to see some sort of um, distinguishing between, between what entrance a car should use and what the pocket park is from, um, because cars on university, do they are going to be turning in there quickly. So um, if, if you could just work with staff to make sure that there's some way to distinguish that if that's um, you know, pulling the, the tables out in front of the building because everything's kind of behind the, the front facade of the building. Um, so that would be um, one thing I'd want to see updated. And then I, I'm, I am concerned about the, um, the finishes facing the existing residents. I like that the balconies are on that corner so it softens it a little bit. Um, and I like the brick, um, but I, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I tend to think that we, sh you know, I, I like that you made the public facades look really nice, but I think we should make the ones um, abutting existing residents look really nice as well. Um, so maybe if if staff and the residents could work together on that, um, that would be really nice. Um, and then besides that, um, yeah, I think just like trying to meet more of the historical um, context of this neighborhood with the, the finishes. So the brick, along 13th and university is nice. And then I did just wanna know from staff if MnDOT ha like has to approve it or just like process wise how that works just for my own benefit. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire and President Olson. My understanding is that public works, uh, whenever we work with an adjacent agency, and sometimes it's head of a county and sometimes it's a state, they have to work in, in kind of conjunction and concert. Um, again, kind of recognizing there's an existing trash that pick up, picks up an existing um, uh, driveway that's, that's there today. So that was part of the evaluation when Public Works looked at this originally. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Baxley. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm tending to um, um, approve this project as well, but I am, because I think the urban spaces are are actually very creative. They're oriented right. We have the pocket park on the south side. Um, but I am super concerned about those two residential walls. There's a urban pattern and typology that exists on 13th Avenue that doesn't exist on university. And when you combine those things around a wall, we create a pretty harsh condition for those neighbors. Um, so I, I think the... Um, really looking at those materials, uh, kind of um, um, playing those down, backgrounding them as much as you can. Um, I think the urban spaces will be great. I just, I just think that that back corner is really challenging. Um, but I, again, I think I find it incompliant with the 2040 plan. Um, and I think it's a, a creative way to maintain an existing structure and create new vital spaces around that. Um, and I, I'll just kind of, you know, I think we can't, the parking issue is, is, is volatile. I mean, the project just before this, we didn't have enough parking on site. This one's got too much parking on site. And I, I, don't, I wonder if it's the plan itself or how the traffic works, but we seem to, we're at loggerheads on every project, whether it's too much or not enough parking. So um, I don't know how to solve that here tonight, but um, that's my comments, thanks. You would be rich if you did. <laughs> I think so. Um, Commissioner Ford. Thank you. Uh, I actually like this project too, but I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, quite concerned about the safety issue and the, the traffic issue, uh, first of all in general, uh, and then the, uh, the exiting and entrancing uh, very, very close to the, uh, the, the traffic signals at uh, 13th and University. I'm actually very familiar with this area. I don't live there, but I'm very familiar with it. And uh, I, it, I think that there are some very serious uh, traffic problems, and that is, and safety problems. And that is what uh, it concerns me. Um, and I, I don't see them being addressed so far. That's why, or at where I am right now. 
I wonder if, I, if, if, uh, if Commissioner Rainville um, might uh, consider uh, laying over the uh, issue for a while, for the next meeting. I see that we have until, am I correct, until uh, the, the, issue, the, the timing is still appropriate, as I call it. I'm looking at the deadlines that are in the uh, report here. Uh, I guess um, I'm not sure what would change between now and a future meeting as far as how we would base our decision or how we would. Uh, well, I'm just asking a question of Commissioner oh. Rainville if he wants to consider that. Uh, I would be agreeable to lean it over if somehow we can get a better handle on, on these uh, uh, concerns that the residents have brought up about uh, the traffic and, and the safety, if that's a possibility. Uh, I guess I'd ask Shanna to um, respond to that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rainville and President Olson. I, I would say that staff has um, uh, reviewed it. The condition exists on both 13th and University. We have a controlled intersection. So the intent behind the design for the applicant was to locate commercial along 13th and to not put the parking garage on 13th. But um, the, the, the tool for evaluating the traffic analysis in depth is our, public, our team in public works, in this case in concert with, with MnDOT. So staff has evaluated the traffic congestion. Residential uses don't have the parking um, uh, changeover like you would see for like maybe like a reception meeting hall or something that has a much higher intensity shopping center uh, traffic use. Um, the, the pro proposed project meets, it doesn't exceed, um, I should say it does not exceed our maximum parking requirement. I, um, I guess it would be helpful for staff to know what kind of evaluation in addition to what's been provided in the staff report would be helpful in making a decision next time. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm not seeing any questions up. I would not support um, pushing this off. Um, I support this project. This reminds me of the Van Buren project. Uh, this, was, this is allowed um, based upon the legal findings that staff have uh, determined. It's in compliance with the comprehensive plan. This, the Planning Commission um, would have to make alternate legal findings to deny this, um, and I'm not seeing what those would be. So I would be opposed to the motion uh, on the table, um, but would support a motion to approve this project today. Commissioner Campbell. Commissioner Rainville, can you, can you share a little bit about your rationale and what legal justification you'd find for denying it? I'm not a lawyer, so I, I do not know what the legal justification is. I'm listening to the residents, and they bring up a really strong argument about traffic. I'm familiar with this intersection, this stretch, and it's dangerous as it is. I'm, I'm posing the question of how do we get an answer to their question about the traffic? Commissioner McGuire? Um, I guess in general, I would support the project too and just say that it sounds like MnDOT has to approve any increased traffic flow onto the existing access point. Is that correct? So I would trust our staff, our police public safety, and then MnDOT staff to evaluate if this access would work because I don't think we have all the traffic counts in front of us and MnDOT would get that information and then city staff would get that information. Is that correct? Ah, thank you, Commissioner McQuire and President Olson. I wasn't sure if that was definitely going to be Sorry. I know no, that's okay. kind of <laughs> rambling and then it would turn <laughs> into a question. just want to make sure I didn't like assume too much. Um, at the, at the jurisdiction about whether or not a traffic study is required is not something I, I could answer today. What I can say is based on city requirements, this proposed project in scale does not rise to the level of a traffic study. We are looking at 53 dwelling units and 56 parking spaces. Um, that is not, um, it doesn't rise to the level of a discretionary travel demand management plan. It doesn't rise to the level of a, of a major travel demand management plan, would, which would be at 250 dwelling units just for scale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess to follow up on that, I appreciate that they have added parking to the project. Um, and 
you know, we, we really can't consider parking at all because we do not have parking minimums in this city. Um, but I appreciate that they added that because I don't think the neighbors want parking in front of their houses. And I don't think we want the access off of 13th. So it feels like we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're either going to put the access on 13th or you're going to put the access on university. So consolidating it on the busiest road makes sense to me. And I think for me personally, I would not want parking um, in front of everyone. You know, people are probably a few people are going to want to have a car. Um, and, you know, I would prefer them parking underground than parking in front of my house, um, especially with the school nearby. So to me, keeping that access off of university is the most thoughtful approach. Um, and then keeping the pocket park more confined to the neighborhood across from um, like Anchor Fish and Chips is right there. I think that's like a nice little vibe to quote bo both of the comments we have in front of us say vibe. Um, so I think they are trying to be thoughtful. So in terms of the things we can consider, if it's you know injurious to the use of other people's property and if it com um, conforms with the 2040 plan, I would say you know it meets the 2040 plan. They're really trying to be thoughtful. I do think there are a couple little places for improvements that I kind of noted on here, um, but. I would, I would support it. All right. Um, yeah, I'll just add, you know, I wish I had said this um, on the Van Buren project. Like I said, this reminds me of that. Uh, you know, we, a lot of these projects go on consent and we don't even talk about them. And because a neighbor, neighborhood organizes, which is great and important, um, you know, not all neighborhoods have the ability to do that or the resources to do that. And we approve those all the time. Um, so I don't know if commissioners aren't reading their packets and they don't know what's going on consent or, you know, why are we treating this project different than other projects that are so similar? Um, so again, I will be uh, voting no on the motion. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please, oh, Commissioner McGuire, sorry. We don't have any findings on the motion. Oh, okay. What is the question right now? <laughs> right. So the motion is to do to deny all of the applications, correct? Um, Shanna, you wanna, thank you. Thank you, Vice President and President. Yes, in order to deny the project, we have to make findings to the contrary, notwithstanding the staff recommendation. So for the rezoning, you would have to find that the rezoning is inconsistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan and state policies where it is in conflict. For the conditional use permit, um, there are a large number of findings that are required um, that we would have to find have findings to the contrary. Same with the variance, same with the site plan review, and lastly, with the preliminary and, and final plat. So there are findings that are associated which, with each of those land use applications, um, and we would need to have findings in order to find to the contrary of staff recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McGuire? Sorry, follow up for staff. Sorry, I was trying to catch you before you walked away. For the conditional use permit findings, it's my understanding a conditional use permit is an allowed use within a district as long as you place certain conditions on it for approval. So a conditional use, which is the PUD in this case, which is odd, is, is essentially an allowed use in that district unless they cannot meet certain conditions. Is that correct? That is accurate. Okay. So we, we'd have to find very specific findings to deny a conditional use permit because we essentially can put stipulations on the conditional use permit. So that's a very difficult bar to deny. All right. Uh, Can I ask a question? The public hearing is, is closed. Um, <laughs> so don't put that mask back on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if, if there are no findings in theory and we voted on a motion without findings, what is the potential outcome? Yes. Well, we can't. I mean, you, you honestly, you have to make findings in order for you to make that decision. And what happens, and there's a follow-up, if you remember for 635 Van Buren, yes. written reasons of denial yeah. have to 
accompany the agenda at the following meeting. So we have to state those, and those have to be adopted by the City Planning Commission at your next meeting. I believe it's on May 23rd. So we need very clear findings um, in order to um, deny this project today. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So uh, would Commissioner Rainville, would you like or, or Commissioner Ford like to try to make some findings? Um. I, I am at a loss. I, I, I understand that this uh, meets all the legal requirements, uh, but where I'm, I'm at a loss is I feel that the neighbors have, have raised some really legit, uh, legitimate uh, objections to this, and and I, and I understand, uh, Miss Sether, that their questions can't be answered now. I, I'm I, I'm hearing that from you loud and clear, and that that just befuddles me why a, a, a legitimate question like a traffic access on a on a straight state highway can't be answered right now for these people. So it, see, we have a um, we have a motion um, that may or may not be supported by the commission, um, and and if it was if we voted no on the motion, then there would be an alternate motion, and then we would presumably adopt that alternate motion. Um, so can we just vote on the motion on the table without findings to see if it fits? <laughs> My understanding is no. You would have to make. Findings. So, what order. is the mechanism to? Can we direct staff to make findings for us, or you know, you see what I'm? I understand. I, what, okay. yeah, I understand the question. Um, in my experience, um, that can occur at the city council where we have staff, um, who uh, legal staff, attorneys, city attorneys. In this case, the staff has prepared the staff report. We have analyzed the project. And mm -hmm. so to make findings contrary, right? I mean, we could. Could we um, just ask uh, Commissioner Rainville to state his reason and use that as a finding to vote and then, okay. All right. Yes. I, I see Thank what you. you. Okay. All right. So if you want to just state your reasons, um, we'll use those as the findings and then vote. So my reasoning to asking to, uh, to den deny this is there are unanswered questions about the traffic impact. All right, we have a motion to deny um, all of the applications for this project. Um, and we have, we have a motion in a second. Those were the findings. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. Nay. Commissioner Campbell. Nay. Commissioner, oh, Commissioner Fiola has left. Uh, Commissioner Ford. Aye. And Commissioner Marwa has left. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Nay. Commissioner Rainville. Aye. President Olson. No. So that's two yeas and four nays. All right, uh, Commissioner McGuire. All right, I would make a motion to adopt all the items in the staff report um, with the specific added condition that the applicant work on the um, facades facing existing residents um, to improve um, those to just be a little more in, in harmony with the existing neighborhood and just work with staff on that item. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Baxley. Oh. Thank you very much. Just a clarification, uh, Commissioner McGuire, would you like to add that condition to the site plan review application? Okay. Yes, please. Thank Thanks you. very much. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Campbell. Commissioner Ford. Uh, no. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Rainville. No. President Olson. Aye. So that's four yeas and two nays. 
All right, that motion passes. Thank you for presenting your project. Uh, are there any announcements from staff? No? Okay. No announcements from staff. Thank you, Shanna, for all your hard work this evening. You've been doing a lot of, a lot of hats here, a lot of roles. Um, anything else from commissioners before we adjourn? All right, so Chair. So oh. Clear, uh, oh. We are meeting at 5.30 on Thursday, is that correct? That's correct, and it, it's in room 100 of the public service building, which is Kitty Corner across the street. Thank you. Correct? Yes. Is that what you were going to say? That was what I okay. was going to say. Okay, thank you for reminding, so, thank you. reminding us of that. Uh, all right, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Our next planning commission uh, meeting will be Monday, May 23rd, and our joint meeting with the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee Commission will be this Thursday, April 28th. Thank you, everybody.